emergency assistance to communities and families affected by the floods in various counties. The areas most affected are parts of Lake Victoria Basin, Turkana, Samburu, Nairobi, Nyandarwa, Nyeri, Kirinyaga, Muranga, Kiambu, Lake Kipia, Meru, Sorry, Tarakanithi, Kitui, Makuini, Machakos, Taita Taveta, and Kajiado, Marsebit, Wajia, Garisa, Isiolo, Mombasa, among other counties, disaster response team have been formed to monitor flood-prone areas following heavy rains that continue to fall. More than 60 people have been reported dead following the floods, and more than a 1,000 have also been displaced. Archbishop of the Catholic Church of Eldoret, Dominic Kimenich, has called on the government to map out dangerous regions during the ongoing floods. Kimenich says this will keep them informed on where to move to in order to avoid being swept by the raging floods as a result of the El Nino rains. Tuwe na hiyo makini kuna sehemu ambazo wakati kinyesha sana inaanza kuboromoka kama unajua kwamba wanaishi mahali ambapo inaanza kuboromoka basi watafuta usalama mahali ambapo iko sawa sawa wafadhali kufanya hivyo kuliko poteza maisha na tunaomba sana pia serikali wasaidie watu wetu waongeleshe watu ili wa, wa, wajikinge na kuwa kwenda mahali ambapo hapakuwa na matara eh, madhara yoyote advising parents on the long holiday the bishop has encouraged them to take part in raising their children by being aware in all the activities they are involved in tukiwa jamaa tukiwa familia jirani tusaidie watoto wetu jirani ukiona mtoto ameenda njia mbazi mzuri ni vizuri kumkemea huyo mtoto na kusahisha yeye tutafute njia ambayo tunaweza kushirikiana zaidi katika hali ya kutunza watoto wetu na kuhakikisha kwamba wako na maadili ambayo itasaidia hawa watoto wetu wakue na kuwa watu wazima Today marks 220 days since cult leader Paul McKenzie was arrested and he's yet to be charged. All his 28 associates have spent more than 150 days in custody, apart from his wife Rhoda Mumboa, who is out on a 400,000 shillings bond term. McKenzie's lawyer Wycliffe Makasembe has however told the court that the continued detention on his clients by the state is tantamount to abuse of their rights. McKenzie and his associates are accused of the deaths of 429 people whose bodies have been exhumed from Shakahola Forest in Kilifi County. They're facing multiple charges including terrorism, murder, aiding suicide, abduction, radicalization, genocide, crimes against humanity and money laundering. Speeding has been cited as the leading cause of death and injuries in road crashes globally, even as road experts push to reduce the road accidents by 50% come 2030. NTSA Deputy Regional Director for Coast John Pateri says that about 4,000 Kenyans lose their lives through road crashes annually. Pateri father called on drivers, even as we approach the festive season, to observe speed limits as he attributed most of the road crashes witnessed in the country to human error. An 85-year-old mother has allegedly been killed by her sons of a land dispute at a village in Nyamira County. Area Chief Beatrice Musa says the body of the woman was found in her room with cuts on various parts of the body. She adds that the suspects have been detained at the Nyamira police station as investigations into the incident continue. Alikuwa amelala huko kijo ikiangalia chini na mgongo wake ulionekana kama ni mtu alichapwa na kitu kama panga alafu kwa shingo kulikuwa na jeraha la panga ni kama alikuwa amekatwa ako na vijana wawili kuna mchukua alisema aongee na mama so ataulizwa mbona basi mkaenda kuangalia mrango mbona iko wazi saa 4 kama muongee na yeye kuna mmoja alisema ndiye alienda wa kwanza akaita mama akuitika akaenda kuita mwingine ndio akakuja kuangalia sasa ni nini that's the news wire i'm lea obaga One hundred two point five Spice FM, Kisumu. The following takes place from six a.m. to ten a.m. every weekday on Spice FM. You tune into Kenya's biggest conversation. My name is Ramanyan. Hey, Amanda. <laughs> hey, Amanda. <laughs> Amanda. <laughs> so now it's over. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. It gets over. Can you imagine you in twenty minutes what the big boys have also done? I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> <laughs>
when you understand about partnership in politics it's like the way marriage is these days when you're looking for a wife you're like oh you know maybe you can help me pay for fees as i pay for the rent or you should you have a lioness living in your bedroom <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you a story. I went for a prayer meeting yeah. which was called for the spouses yes. of candidates yes. for senators and governors. Mm. And when I got to the gate, the lady who was the, the secretary, she refused to, she said me, no, no, no. <laughs> Leo tunataka wa mama. Leo ni wa mama. I'm telling her, no, no, no. <laughs> she said, no. Sio siku yenu. And I thought, there's a problem here. You know, because if it was a man, I would, but this was a lady. It will be called first ladies until you change the name. <laughs> The Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation. Revenge is for children, mm. it's for kids. When you grow up, you realize the best revenge you, you can take on somebody is to ignore them. Now I'm just new in politics. Mm. It is not everybody's cup of tea. That's why some people come in one term and that's it for them. Political parties in this country do not have ideologies whether luring or otherwise. And that is the effect of corruption. Any time an offense occurs anywhere in the country, it is the job of the Inspector General to look into it. Whether it's corruption, whether it's murder, whether it's betting, that is his job. If we have chosen to be a corrupt nation, then we produce corrupt leaders. Everything then becomes chaotic that you cannot be able to change a nation. The Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation. It's critical that people pay taxes. But then, taxation has to have a limit. When you start overtaxing people beyond certain limit, then this is now we call robbery with violence. We are all struggling, but we don't show. If you're not doing well, shame on you. But you have to say, I'm broke and I'm struggling. <laughs> we are not okay until everybody is it's okay. okay. We are pretending to have political parties. Why don't we just be honest? And we say, these are the Luria's, these are the Kambas, these are the Kikuyu's, and we are find ourselves in Kenya. You know, with, with politics and leadership, no matter what you do, mm. there will always be a complaint. <laughs> there will always be the assumption that you're either stealing or you're not doing things right. As a dear, don't fear. If you know you're doing the right thing, you've thought about it, you've got an expert advice, do it, then understand later. This country, we don't need prayers. Prayers mm. is between you and God. Good governance and thinkers who care about the country and not their stomach. Yes. That's what we need. The Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation. Good morning and I love your show. Thank you. <laughs> Having come from a Kikuyu radio background, I migrated to Spice hmm. <laughs> because of the content. I was born in a slum, but somehow I got a break in life. So sometimes when you see the sweating coming out because of the passion and whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> Behind the noise, there are people. And we share the same umbilical cord. It shouldn't be like that. I am so disappointed. We used to tell Honda uh, Boraila Molotinga that he's doing police of conmanship. And even President Uhuru Kenyatta, Sirikali, he is going to conmanship earlier. You cannot promise people that you reduce tax, then you double. In politics, mm. there is uh, the issue of trust. Mm. For you to turn around and then stab the same people who gave you that trust, there is no other level of dishonesty. And I Good morning and welcome to Tuesday. There is a lot of rain opening up, coming down from the heavens. And we already know what that's going to mean. It's that it's going to slow down things just a little bit, actually quite some. It doesn't matter where you are in the country this morning. The heavens have opened and the rain is coming down in sheets. It's done so all night and it's likely to continue for most parts of this morning. So... The two things, first of all, before we get to look at what's going on on the roads, if you see puddles of water, you want to be very careful about where you get in because we don't know how deep they are. So avoid those at all costs. And then secondly, you want to then use your lights and you want to go a little bit slower because everybody's slowing down just a tad and water is going to slow you down. Okay, so let's take a look and we can see there's movement already coming out of Westlands going towards the CBD and the build-up on the Thicker Super Highway hasn't just yet started. We're looking at some movement on Moranga Road and we're going to touch on that Globe Cinema uh, overpass, underpass uh, situation and getting into the CBD. For now, on Jogo Road, it doesn't look too bad, but the build-up of traffic has already begun. As you get onto Landis and then onto um, the roundabout at Kamkunji, that's also moving and quite quickly. So let's take a look in about half hour and see how all this progresses. One, be careful, be safe, and let's arrive alive. Let's talk on Spice FM KE on X this morning.
This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is The Situation Room. The only way uh, to start good morning, your day. and how are you? It's 10 minutes after 6 o'clock, and yes, the heavens have opened. It's raining, it's pouring, the old man is snoring. Everything is happening this morning, and it's coming down in sheets. It doesn't matter where you are around the country. And I just looked at the forecast today. It doesn't matter. Garissa, Nairobi, Mombasa, Embu, Nyeri, Eldoret, Kericho, Nairobi, Kwale, Lamu, everywhere. It is raining this morning. It's rained all night. And the forecast tells us that it's going to keep raining through the day. So that's what it's going to look like. And a couple more days in some parts of the country as well. So where are you today? And I hope that um, it's not going to be too difficult a situation for folks to get up and get out and about where they're going. Karibuni sana to this morning's biggest conversation. Situation Room, we are here with you. Siti, good morning. Good morning, do. How are thou? I at fine. Thou fine. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and what about yourself, Eric Latif? I am fine as well. Wonderful. Yes. Mm. Are you well? I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's good. It's good. Yes, that rain, my friend. Mm. Way, 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 way. Way. Mm. It's doing the thing. It's for talking. <laughs> <laughs> mm. It is for talking. Heavy, heavy, heavy. Now, can you imagine all the people who um, have got to go wading through the mud because there are many areas that don't have walkways, eh? Mm. So, no paved pedestrian walkway. And then you are wading through the mud and then you go and you don't even find a bus stop that's been made. Anywhere. So, you have to stand somewhere and wait for a matatu. As you get rained on. As you get rained on. Yep. And then you alight from that matatu and you have to walk, walk, walk a, a certain distance to where you need to go this morning. As you continue getting rained on. Yes. It is really, it's really. Terrible. It's horrible. It is. I feel, I feel for everybody who will be going through that today. I do. Uh, I'll keep all any. Why? Yeah. Anyway, welcome to Kenya's Biggest Conversation. It's Tuesday. It's the 21st day of November 2023. You know, I discovered something. <laughs> I sent you guys something. I was only like, where? Everybody must get this E-Teams thing. My friend, I'm not quite sure. You know, I did a, <laughs> it did a number on my brain. And I said, eh, <laughs> what is that? Why? If you do some work as Nduoko, right? Mm. And you build mm. an organization as mm. Nduoko, you need to have, need to have the thing. an E-Teams thingy. Oh, um, uh, did you go to Kapamoja? Tunailawana? In the explanation, like any... Tunailawana? Eh. Otherwise, that company will tell you, you know, we cannot expense that payment. We can't put it anywhere and say, you know, what we paid and do oh, this now, this number of times. So, so wait, 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 wait. You need to go and get the registration or you need to have the... E-teams is E. No, you it's, not the, it's not the it's not the it's not the that physical ETI. I understand. Mm. I'm trying the word has disappeared. Application. So you must have logged the app. The app. And now this KRA people, do you go with your phone or your laptop to them, they install it for you. Uh, what's the price? Free. <laughs> but yeah. the cost is you go and sit there at KRA. That thing is not free. Let us see Miyako. They install. And if you lose that phone, you lose your e-teams. So, so once you install it, it <coughs> what does the e-teams do on your phone? 
<laughs> it sits there beyond beyond the occupying space beyond looking at what else you're doing mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and if you don't have it what sub- what services will you be denied well oh, you will not be able to build many people so you can't get paid if you do business or you do work consultancy for example and so you do some paid. consultancy for a company that company will tell you you know what eh? because i cannot put you that payment that i'm making to you anyway in my books you have no use to me <laughs> think about it everybody so we'll get the carry guys to come and give us this story again we'll get them to yeah, come and stop yeah, it yeah. ah yeah uh, to stop it misbehaving <laughs> <laughs> what shall we be discussing today we'll be joined by an advocate of the high court of kenya senior lecturer at kabrak university and governor kawera mwangaza's lawyer at uh, the senate recently Elisha Ongoya through the eagle's eye dissecting impeachments in Kenya this man has been there he saw it he dealt with the senators mm. he dealt with Kawera Mwangaza he listened to what the MCAs were saying let him come and tell us uh-huh. so what did you see and what's happening and then at 8 a.m. let's talk about values so the man who has been given the mandate of spearheading the fight against corruption and restoring ethics in our country or at least safeguarding ethics in our country is the Reverend Dr. David Oginde who is the chairperson of the EACC he comes in at 8 a.m. to talk about values and then at 9 o'clock investments investment attraction in Kenya so we know that there's an institution that's been created specifically to attract investment and make Kenya a globally competitive in- investment destination this one is called Can invest the Kenya Investment Authority. Its managing director is June Chapkeme. She joins us at 9 a.m. for that conversation. So sawa. Mm. Hi, meanwhile you tell us the way it's not raining and then we'll look do like that. We are live streaming the show as usual. Tell us where you're locked in from. Kaiser Obed is awake. Kaiser where are you? I don't know. He just says he's awake, he's listening. <laughs> okay. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. At 16 degrees, it's raining in Nairobi, highs of 21, and we'll see lows of 16 today. We'll see lows of 15 in a rainy Nakuru going to highs of 21. The rain is also coming down in Nyeri, highs of 21 as well, and Eldoret raining heavily at 14, going to highs of 21 today. It'll come down to lows of 14. And we're looking at uh, rainy heavy rain in Mombasa at 25 with highs of 30, and in Malindi this morning, the rain is coming down as well at 25. It'll go to highs of 31. into Kisumu it's cloudy raining as well at 20 with highs of 27 and lows of 19 and it's mostly cloudy at 19 in Kakamega with the rain coming down as well at 25 that will be the high today coming down to lows of 16 let's take a look into Kampala where the rain is coming down as well it's also raining in Dar es Salaam at 24 with highs of 31 and we'll see those highs of 27 in Kampala Mogadishu is clear the one place where it's not raining this morning at 25 highs of 31 and it's clear as well in Addis Ababa at 11 with highs of 24 Johanna Pittsburgh rain as well thunderstorms highs of 29 and it's clear for now in Lagos going to highs of 32 cloudy with some rain at 25 in Kinshasa going to highs of 30 it's 9 degrees and sunny in Beijing Tuesday afternoon going to highs of 14 and lows of 3 while it's mostly cloudy in Paris at 9 and cloudy at 11 in London 4 degrees and cloudy in New York Monday night coming into Wednesday highs of 8 and lows of 0 mature intelligent talk every morning spice up yourself mornings done right 94.4 spice fm nairobi chapter 6 A number of people Mwalimu Dominic Nyabuto is tuned in from Kisi Kiembu Amasago base eh, and he says mpakatami tamati Uh-huh. Gustav Mandela says good morning everybody tuned in this is the Spice family yes tuned in from Mombasa Robert and Bogo and Atieno Jermaine Jackson is tuned in Colin Skiptai Kipsat is also tuned in as well hey everybody woke up with the rain yeah food delivery will be difficult to hit flood hit areas wow uh that's true mm-hmm. uh, good morning don and we saw that 
helicopter crash that was uh, supposedly taking relief food to a certain part of the country yesterday uh, was not a good one to see. Uh, this is the father of El Nino, he said. Uh, R is listening in from a chilly Iceland. Hi, fa hi, family. Watching in from the land of 10,000 lakes in the USA. Good morning, Zach. Um, get me some Kenyan chai to help with the weather. I know. You guys who live in Iceland, this is the time now where you will only see this. You will not see the sun until March. Isn't it? Mm hmm Oh, yeah. And uh, Don, you want me to say Nthawi? Nthawi means what? Time. It is... Uh. Okay. <laughs> Agri Momani says, good morning. Where have the funds for El Nino gone when Kenyans are dying? To Metenga, to Mejipanga, and yet floods and deaths at this rate. Mm. It is true. JB Mutua says, good morning, everybody. Ricardo Mariera says, good morning, kings and queens. Kitengela Ikolokt. Sir George Gashoiri says, good morning, Ndu City. And Eric Edna, good morning to you. Manchester to Kolok, despite the dark and chilly morning. Yes, yes. Oleg Melk says, good morning. A blessed day ahead to you. Greetings from Kibra. Stay positive. Yes, we all try. Joel Odondi, good morning, CT Eric and Ndu. I am watching you guys as I end my day in Kansas, where it has been raining cats and dogs. It's a global thing, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I love you people, it's but raining. On, in, it's raining in Kansas. All right. Yeah. In Cali. Mm. Well, nah. Telling you. Huh? It says, I love you guys, but on credit. Mm. I tell you what? <laughs> a relative of mine should speak in English. <laughs> <laughs> Joel Odondi, your cousin huh? said that you speak in English. What is he saying? Credit. I say, I love you in credit. Mm, on, but on credit. <laughs> <laughs> on credit. <laughs> As in, What? What? You give me back later. So he's lending us the love, okay. or we owe him love. What's the, okay. And what's the interest rate? <laughs> tell us, please. Moses Nyambura says, "Good morning, Team Kubwa. Is it possible for a government rep to come and tell us how they have prepared and what they are doing about the heavy rains and its effects? E.g., e.g., Rigiji. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Bahrain is where David Weeds is this morning. Totti Bishop says, "Imagine a president going to beg other presidents to provide employment opportunities for citizens in his country." Uh huh. It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Oh, and Wasiri says, good morning. Tune in from New York. Do you remember Shakahola? Yes. Mm. Shakahola is still, still a thing. Now, I had the craziest thought yesterday. When I was looking at these rains, Shakahola is in Kilifi County. Yeah. And Kilifi County is one of the hard hit areas when we're talking about these floods. Yeah. What is happening with the continued excavation in Shakahola? <sighs> Mud? Now it's raining. Yes. <sighs> when it wasn't raining. It was like that. Now it is raining. <laughs> like Even this like and that like that and like this. Mm -mm. I, I, I thought about it and I shuddered and I said, what? E. E. And then the state of the bodies that they are seeking to exhume. Mm. I tell you. Crazy. With this, with this water, with this rain. Mm. Mm. Jeffrey Mogaka says, good morning, people <laughs> tuned in from Mombasa. Mvoi mepungua hiyo relief food ndiyo sujaona popote. Ambia Edna salimia wa Kenya wote. Edna, you have the green light to all the Kenyans. Greet them. Mm. <laughs> Joe Mungai says, good morning, Team Kubwa. Sorry, I've been away without official leave. Yes, but you're back. Well done. Mm. Spice is home and there's no place like home. Indeed. Good morning, beautiful folk. Let's drop everything and talk about El Nino. Akiki says, Eric Okero says, good morning, guys. I watch you guys every day from Dubai. Thank Karibu you so much, Sana. Sana. Mm -hmm. Luca Biero is tuned in. Soulful, Robert, Desmond Otis. And he says, Ndu, Eric. You know Eric and Latif are the same person? Mm. Just letting you know. It's Eric Latif. One person. Then the other person is CT. Oyaore Uhuru Duto. How did I say that? You do. You put it very well. Like Thank that. you very much. Oh, you said it very, 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 very well. <laughs> <laughs> Good Say, morning, all of you. All of you. Mm -hmm. It's re it's weathering me this side. Milby Kiprono says, "Good morning and loving the rains." I am with you. You know, I just feel for those who who can't get through. Isaac Babji is here this morning. Tattoo Zero says he's here. Keith. Uh, is here as well. Gamira Shiro Moshai says good morning. Everybody is here. Linus, Margaret Wanjohi, we see you. And Anne Gore from Saboti, Anthony Onyango, Edward Ngonze, Leban Sialo, Victoria Namtosi. Mm. Wah, wah, wah. I've not even gotten to everybody. But everybody is here. Let's go. Ah, yeah. Very, very good. City? Yes. The proverb? Um. Probably are still from the country of Namibia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a little rain each day <laughs> will fill the rivers to overflowing. Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> How apt. <laughs> a little rain each day will fill the river to overflowing. To overflowing, yes. 
Okay. There's a question you asked yesterday, mm. and today would be a good day for me to respond to it. Mm -hmm. How many tribes, how many ethnic groups are there? No, maybe there are just 10, actually. There are 10 groups. 10. 10 tribes. 10 tribes. Okay. And the largest being the Ovambo. Uh -huh. They comprise 50% of the population of the country. What? Yep. So what does that tell you? Hey, the third thing of numbers, what was it called? Tyranny of numbers. That one. This one is a genuine tyranny. Kabisa. Haya basi. Tufanya namna iyo. Haya. Politics of fuel. The standard, that's what's on the front page this morning. Uh -huh. But let's look at a story under that. The window treasury used to get money to finance oil deals. The finance ministry is said to have invoked Article 223 that gives it powers to spend money and seek parliamentary approval later. We know that exists. Mm. Now, through this, it is said to have allocated the Ministry of Energy money that was not in the budget. How mm. much, you ask? $5.9 is the initial budget that had been approved by the National Assembly before the start of the 2022-2023 financial year. The ministry had been allocated 5.9. To do what? You know, to do their things. Okay. Then now, mm. it however ended up spending 43 billion, you know, just a little bit more in the tune to the tune of, you know, 33 mm -hmm. uh, million. Mm -hmm. uh, or even more than that, actually. B. 38 billion more. Mm -hmm. um, this was drawn from the consolidated fund and another 20 billion that had been raised by the ministry's internal operations without approval by MPs with the mon ministry calling up Article 223 of the Constitution to access the funds. So they basically said, look, we yes, we drew this money, but we've told you later, so you know, deal with it, even if you shout. <laughs> what did they use the money for? That's the question. Now, uh, I'll tell you the details of what they used the money for, but just so you know, those are the numbers we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. 5.9 billion approved. 43 billion we use and then ask for forgiveness later. Okay. That's what we're looking at, and we'll look at the nitty-gritty of how. It's not a pretty picture, but Rilo Dinka said yesterday, the CS for Energy and Petroleum, Cheer Cheer, and National Treasure, Treasury CS in Jugon and Dungo have certainly committed criminal offences, abused office, and gone against the Constitution. Huh? Mm. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. Aviation and Authority. Uh, we had missed this Raila. For five years, we did not have this Raila. <laughs> He's back. <laughs> do, 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 do. Ah, good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, welcome back, Baba. He's Baba, while back. you are away. Yeah. Baba, while you were away, do okay. you know what happened? Uh huh. Western Hotel. Yes. Ghosts like Casper Boo, they're back. Because the Aviation Authority is reawakening, rejigging that thing and said, <laughs> you think we had gone away? We had not gone away. What do they want? They're asking, you, where, how did you get this land? I'll tell you. Ah. Aviation Authority reawakens Ruto's Western Land ghosts. Mm -hmm. Intrigues surround the exit of Kenya Power Boss. So yes, there was an exit. It's in the financial standard today. And the World Bank is going to give Kenya money. Chop, pepper, shishi, to the tune of 1.8 trillion shillings over Apobasi. the next 12 years. Or 12 tass. years. Or three. Tass. three years, sorry. 12 billion dollars. Peso <laughs> tas. <laughs> <laughs> 12 billion dollars. Yes, please. 1.8 trillion shillings. If you thought that Pesa money was the problem. What's World the Bank problem? Says, Kenya. We got you. Yeah. Don't now worry about a thing. To tapiga <laughs> <laughs> now you thought people were traveling. Now they will travel. Uh -huh. Underwater is what the nation is saying today. Yeah. Record rains have pounded several parts of the country over the past week, leaving death and devastation in their wake. 20 people dead, more than 80,000 families displaced, and 33 counties drenched. Tourism has been hit as floods submerge coast hotels. The SGR cargo has been delayed, while towns, estates, and villages across the country have been marooned. El Nino is here, and the toll is climbing. It's covered on 4, 5, 6, and 7 of the nation. We'll look into details of that. And the weatherman has warned Kenyans to brace themselves for even more rains in the coming days. Where? It's like that. In the midst Backwards. of all of that, there's a good story. Uh -huh. A baby has mm. been transfused while in its mother's womb, and the baby was then born healthy. What? That is a good thing. That is serious science, huh? Yeah. Here yeah. in Kenya, at the Kenyatta National Hospital. No less. Oh. Done there. World class. 
Very good. This keyboard man had 29 children. They're yeah. still fighting over his wealth. Just in case you thought it was over. It's All 29 of them. They're saying, I, I, we want. Okay. On the back page of the nation, you remember Maisha number? Mm. MPs are said, <laughs> excuse me, you people have rolled out this thing. Well done. How much did it cost? Tell us. Is the card there? Where is it? How much did you use? We want to know. We want to know. They're asking questions about Maisha. Uh, the Maisha number. Was it rolled out? Uh, well, if they're asking questions about the money that was used. <laughs> Didn't, didn't uh, not yet, right? I, I not yet. It's, I it's, it's an idea. It's an idea. It's going to be rolled out, but money has been spent already. already. Yes, already please. What? Oh, no, no, no. How much it will cost, not oh. how much it has cost. Ah. So. Okay. So. If it doesn't make sense, then forget about it. Okay. That's what they're saying. Okay. Mm. The Business Daily. You've told us about 1.8 trillion shillings yes, from the World Bank yes, coming in the next like that. Eh? Yes, please. 12 billion USD. Mm. Yeah. And they say, you know what? We're going to support this country. I mean, we will like what this country is doing. I mean, I'm just, um, and our president met with the president of the World Bank. What's his name? Banga. Bani. Banga. What's mm. his name? Bungoja. Somebody or the other thing. No, <laughs> he wears a turban. <laughs> and I'm telling you something with the other thing. Sing, do you sabab I've got it right. You, just you did. <laughs> <laughs> so what is his name? Mm. Yeah? Apart from, apart from uh, the, the one I've just mentioned. Yeah. So I'll yeah. Say, I'll, I'll AJ. AJ Banga. 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 Mm. Yes. Yes. Sing. City has insisted. Aya sawa chukua yo. The other headline. Equity Group, hmm? mm. they have, uh, you know, you've brought in money, then they have lent out money, then they've used the money for other things, and then, and then there are some interest, they've mm. paid out interest on some maybe financial loans that they have, nini, oh, oh, oh. then there's tax, they, they paid tax. <laughs> the money that they're left with now, mm. pesa yao mm. 34.6 billion shillings. Yani wa maliza kila kitu. First nine months of the year. <laughs> on 34 billion shillings ya kukula. Okay. Double digit growth from subsidiaries in the East African region lifted equity groups net profits to 34.6 billion shillings in the first 9 months of the year, mitigating the 20% dip in earnings from the Kenyan subsidiary. The 3.7 growth in net profit from the 33.4 billion reported in a similar period last year came on the bank on the back of a rise in profitability in DR Congo. Uganda, Rwanda, and Tanzania. I'm telling you, DRC. Hey. <laughs> Cash cow for equity. Higher. Uh, there's something called um, roaming fees. The rates that telcos charge rival operators to connect their subscribers in areas where they lack service coverage in Kenya should be negotiated commercially. A study by the communications regulator has said, handing a boost to Safaricom, which is the largest network spread countrywide, and tower operators. Okay? Then there's a very interesting story on page 3. The Kenya Revenue Authority has opened a new battlefront with lawyers as it seeks to collect taxes on interest earned on billions of cash held in client accounts in a far-reaching move that has sent shockwaves in the legal profession. So you, you've given money to your lawyer. The lawyer is holding the money in a client account. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's you escrow. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. That money earns interest. Who eats the interest? KRA wants to eat it. KRA says, you know, Sasa, ask his friend. <laughs> See, there's, there's an income there. <laughs> so it must be taxed. There's a tax called income tax in this country. <laughs> Sawa, my friend. Sawa. Yes. But now the lawyers are like, Apana, we, 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 Top right hand corner in Till Green. Mm. Matt predicts heavy rains warns of fake weathermen. I don't know what on earth they're talking fake about. Fake weathermen. Okay. We know who they we are. We know who they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Guy. We have been warned against him, <laughs> them. Sorry. <laughs> Five day forecast. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> Fuel saga. Raila targets CS Chirchir and Dungu as Middle East oil deal gets murkier. 
I would have thought it would get it's getting slippery here. Mm. Leadership wrangles. Mm. NCIC to probe Natambea over alleged hate speech remarks. Ethnic contempt. This is story on page 8. NCIC. Allah? Yes. Okay, so. Ile cohesion ile. Ile cohesion ile. Okay. Safeguards. Food prices remain high and government raises charges to get revenue. Maize rice tax waivers cost taxpayers 16 billion. <laughs> oh, those for those imports. Me I don't understand. <laughs> you know the imports. And then we waived the duty so that we can allow rice to come into the country. Now okay, are saying this story have made 16 billion out this of story mm. this thing was it not the Kenya National Trading Corporation story yes yes is. so after all this time is when we are figuring this out yes please but it's not a loss really i mean it's just anyway at it costs taxpayers how can it cost us and we already paid the tax and dumdwe ile umelipa hiyo atujalipa atujalipia tax ule no ule mtu hajalipia tax Anyway, it's 24 minutes to 7. Let's take this break tell us about traffic and also tell us about Kiwi. Now? Yes. Okay. So, yeah. step up and shine with Kiwi. I know it's raining, it's pouring. Still an opportunity for you to step up and shine. Kiwi says, walk into any supermarket today. As you're stepping up and shining, get a tin of the new um Kiwi, the new logo tin, and then you will dial star 459 star 5 hash. and you follow the instructions you could win airtime data instantly and then you also get a chance to enter into the draw 35000 shillings four people every week what does it do it goes to a school fees come january 35000 shillings imagine if your school fees was 50000 shillings and then kiwi gives you 35000 shillings you just need to now look for 15 isn't it it's mm. great stuff you can do it for somebody and do it for yourself step up and shine with kiwi this is the situation room The only way to start your day. All right, so the streets very busy because of the rain that's coming down. That looks like it's going to take us for a while then getting through towards traffic hour. We saw some movement already heavy on Jogo Road as you're trying to get into the CBD. That still continues. People seem to be afraid when it comes to the rain, but not on the thicker superhighway. Folks have said rain what? We still need to go and they're out and about. It's heavy going towards the Pangani underpass and then out towards Pangani at the shopping center through towards Muranga Road. that is already doing the business there. Are you coming in through Muthaiga on Gigiri Road? It's also starting to build up. That construction takes place and still there. The rain is compounding things because we've got pools of water. Please, please and one more please. Don't get into a pool if you do not know how deep it is. Shallow water can also move things. Be careful, please. We'll take a look at what happens and we'll come back in about half an hour and see how things may have progressed. Find a good route, let us know. Find one that's impassable, let us know that as well. Well, and we'll share on Spice FM KE on X. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice FM. Story about the rain. There's a guy. His name is Joe Muga, mm. and he said, "Good morning. I met Superlative. You are super, uh, ah. and you're also a smart guy." And he says, "Hopefully, one day we'll meet Uncle Muga. Is that your nephew, Joe Muga?" He says they're not related. But he's calling him uncle. But Let it's me okay. just put it to you this way: I have many relatives. Everybody, Everybody is an uncle, and, Everybody. and I do not know all my relatives. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to check on that just to be sure who's who. So he wants to meet Uncle Muga, Muga and Sweet Ndu, Sweet Ndu, one Bas, of these fine days. Yeah. Okay, but I'm not going to scare you. But I'm not going to Okay, sweetie. You see, <laughs> you if Sweetie Joe? or if Sweetie needed a human <laughs> representation, this is it. Right here. Hey, Muga. Good morning. Good morning, Joe morning to you, Joe. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the nation really looking into dedicated pages um, to what's going on with the rains, death and destruction as floods maroon homes. This is what we've seen. Of course, we don't want to record uh, reports constantly on death and loss. Mm-hmm. It is not a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is important to show the picture of what is really going on around the country today. and i thought again that it's a bit sad that uh, unfortunately at this juncture there is little you can do 
to mitigate against what is already happening. Yeah. You know, there's very little you can do. You yeah. cannot say that it is today we are going to look for outlets to harvest the water. Mm. You cannot say that it is today that we're going to barricade areas or or what's the word where they put up the sacks of like um soil so that the water will not pass through. I can't mm. remember. But mm. anyway, it's, you get it's what a you're bit, saying. You, you get what I'm saying. Mm. It's late in the game to be able to do that. It's another lesson in pre-planning. And the questions start to arise that in terms of mitigation efforts that were going to be done through financing for counties in order to make sure that this destruction did not reach the levels that we are seeing today, what were those? 20 people already around the country have died as a result of the flooding. 80,000 families have been displaced and the rains keep coming. So this is not that they were displaced and now it's over. Mm -hmm. They've been displaced. The rains keep coming. More people. Will more people be displaced? Of course. Yes. It is going to happen. Yep. It is going to happen. The pictures that we saw out of Mombasa last week and other parts of the coast and even other parts of the other side of the country where people had to wade through to get to where they're going. You open your door, not even you don't even have to open the door. Inside your house, there's water. And you can imagine that you're going somewhere in the morning. How do you reach? What do you do? So the glaring question here is that in the face of all of this destruction that is going on today, mm. there are losses and there are huge ones. There's also reporting of a story where tourism has also been affected because we're looking at parts of the country where certain hotels are submerged. Tourists are stuck in their hotel rooms. They cannot come out mm. of their hotel rooms mm. due to the rains. These are things that are happening today. They're happening right now. The rains have caused floods across the country, forcing hoteliers to stop outdoor activities. Friday, some areas of Sarova White Sands Hotel in Mombasa were flooded, forcing staff to use vehicles to ferry snacks to more than 300 visitors who were attending a conference. The guests were stuck at the conference facility waiting for the waters to subside. Pride in Paradise Beach Resort, guests attending conferences were also stuck in various rooms due to the heavy rains. While the hoteliers have not received any cancellations, they are worried that if the situation persists, tourists may cancel their travel plans. They are already receiving inquiries from tourism about the weather. Mombasa is a beach destination, and mind you, we are going into high season. Actually, already started high season. People travel for relaxation on the beach. With all these weather issues, we will receive cancellations. Of this, they are sure, according to the Kenya Association of Hotel Keepers and Caterers Coast Executive Director Sam Ikwai. Mm. That's what it looks like. So it's not just families. We're looking at the economy taking a hit. Quite a number of things happening it's as a, a result one. of this. And then the cost on infrastructure, mm. which will now again come, all these 1.8 trillion shillings from the World Bank will go into infrastructure repairs. Okay. In 2009, the government announced plans to tarmac the 147-kilometer Garissa Nuno Modogashi Road with a contract awarded to Saudi Arabia-based Icon Construction Limited. Remember our friend Abdullahi Alas, mm -hmm. who has used this road. Several financial institutions in the Middle East had agreed to fund the project, and in 2011, Icon moved to the site. Those that funded the project included Kuwait Fund for Arab Economic, Saudi Fund for Development, OPEC Fund for International Development, Arab Bank for Economic Development in Africa, and Abu Dhabi Fund for Development. Together, they invested 10 billion shillings. The Ministry of uh, Transport, Infrastructure, Housing, Urban Development, and Public Works supervised this project. The raging floods have exposed the poor workmanship of this particular road. We've seen photos of this particular road where an entire stretch of the road has just been wiped away. Mm. Now, this icon company, they moved out of sight um, after a surveyor was killed in 2013 in security. In 2015, Jiangxi Zongmei Engineering Group Limited, a Chinese company, took over and agreed to do the remaining 135 kilometers. They did the Nuno Modogasha stretch under tight security. Kenha, Northeastern Regional Manager, Huntington Kidagasia, Kidagisa says the budgetary constraints and insecurity led to low quality work on the road. Because of poor quality, uh, security mm -hmm. and because cash was not coming as it should have been coming from the National Treasury, it meant that um, even in design, we messed it. This is what he says. We had budgeting challenges. Treasury was to provide 20% of the total budget. The designers failed to factor in heavy flooding. Why? The contractor failed to build the structures that were needed because they did not anticipate flooding while designing the road. Eric, 
we cannot blame the contractor because based on the budget you can only do what you can afford mm -mm. a bridge on that road will cost us about two billion shillings a box culvert will cost 25 million shillings 25 million shillings can give about five kilometers of a road without a structure i'm sorry i don't buy it for nothing Last week, we had a gentleman here mm. from the Architects Association of Kenya, mm. and they talked about building... He was the deputy... Deputy president, president right? Mm. And he talked about... Um, we talked about... Had a conversation here Weather about... Weatherproofing our road. Infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure. Infrastructure. Infrastructure, which yeah. includes roads. Yeah. It includes buildings. And any architect contractor worth their salt knows the environment within which you reside mm. and those things are to be taken into consideration before you commence yep you have to know that this is the geographical area where we are mm. certain things will happen as a result of your situ mm. what are you doing and how are you constructing as a result of that so, so this is what they're saying mm. that so yes we know if we were to do the you know a class road mm. in this area and we are waterproofing it for floods that will may come once in 15 years, once in 20 years, we will spend billions of shillings more. And we don't have. Than we have. Instead of doing that, how about we just build a road that is passable, put culverts, okay? We know that in case of rain, small, small rain, culverts can uh, allow the water to pass. And then instead of using that money because we don't have it, we'll take that money elsewhere and build another road. Or stretch the kilometers, but then you still come back after a few years when this road. So has when been that once in fifteen years, will come and do it the again. floods come. Those heavy floods that you know are uh, once in fifteen years yeah. or twenty years. When yeah. they come, now we'll deal with them. Now, now we'll deal with them. Mm. <laughs> okay. Basically, that's what Ken is saying. Caught between a rock and a hard place. Mm. Now, what what do we do? Do we actually go for, you know, the A standard? Or do we look and say, a standard is going to cost this much. We will not get this money. And we won't do any other road. And we won't do any other road. Let's go for B standards. I can see, look, crazy mm. as it sounds, I can see the sense. Mm. I can. It's, it's, it's making some sense. It is. In a way. It Only is. that now. <sighs> exactly. Yeah. Mm. Uncle Muga. Mm. Yes, please. I am looking. Mm at the star mm. and I'm taking pictures of certain articles I'm looking at. Mm. For future reference? Yes. Okay. To also send to some individuals later. Mm. But the picture that caught my eye this morning uh -huh. was one of a helicopter that crashed in Wajir. Yeah. This helicopter was uh, escorting KCSC examination materials to Arba Jahan. Okay. Somehow this is the picture. Yeah. So this helicopter saw noise. Mm. This is a good story in that mm. every effort is being made to ensure that students who are supposed to be sitting for the exam get their papers. Get their papers. Okay. This is an unfortunate incident, mm. an unfortunate accident, and one <clears throat> feels yes. Remember that story that we once uh, talked about the Solai Dam and the issues around it. Yes. Uh, a while back, uh, there was an out of court settlement where the victims as well as the owners of the dam had come to an understanding mm -hmm. and according to what i'm reading in the papers the understanding was that the adults who lost in the tragedy would be paid 1.2 million and the children who were bereaved as a result of the death of a parent would be paid 800,000 shillings mm -hmm. now the state who had taken this matter to court have also applied for the case to be withdrawn mm -hmm. so it appears that this case it's not it's being settled. The settlement is okay. So the, it it appears okay. that there's been some agreement mm. and this case is now going to be settled once mm. and for all. Explain to me why the children are, earning, are getting less. Less. I don't know. Mm. I don't know. What do you think? I think the people who should have been given more money are the children. Mm. It they should have been the other way around mm. because the children have a longer time to live. Mm. They would need the money more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then the parent. That is my thinking. And it will take them a long time before they can earn for themselves. <coughs> Especially yes. if they are minors. Yes. So you're given 800,000 shillings, it goes to school fees and then? It will go to yeah, school fees and, school and fees. it will get finished. That's yeah. it. And if there's a, an, adult, an adult managing it, there is no guarantee that, that money will actually end up where it's supposed to end up. Mm. The point I'm trying to make here is, mm. I do not know what it was that 
made them arrive at this understanding. Mm. There had been an understanding at an earlier time mm. that the payment ought to have been 500,000 and then 300,000. Mm. But this is the figure that was arrived at. Mm. The details of why it was arrived at and the arrangement mm. that I'm now reading, I do not know. Ah, okay. What I do know, however, is that very many of the people who are victims mm. also happen to people who worked on that farm. Uh -huh. Yes. This particular farm employs very many people in that particular area. Mm. Yes. So there is a good relationship. There always been a good relationship. And it's probably why this settlement was able to be reached because these are people who have actually known each other. They belong to the same community. And it's generational. It's, yeah. it's, it's like there are people who've been working, their fathers worked there, some older uh, relatives worked there. So it mm. isn't something that, uh, it isn't a relationship that was forged simply because yeah. there was this terrible incident. Hmm. Okay. Yes. Let's go to the courts, shall we? Mm -hmm. Religion defied, a child born out of wedlock is granted inheritance. It is discriminatory for a child born out of wedlock to be denied inheritance solely because they were born out of an illegitimate union, the Court of Appeal has ruled. Mm -hmm. In what is being called a landmark ruling, a third judge, a three judge bench, rather, comprising Justices Gatembe Cairo, Pauline. Um, Nyamwea and George Odunga, no surprise there, mm. agreed that despite religion abhorring sex before marriage, it is unfair to sideline children born from such escapades when their fathers die. Mm -hmm. The three judges were determining a case of a man who had a child with a woman before marrying her under the Islamic religion. Islamic law dictates that where a child has been born out of marriage, he or she can only inherit from the mother mm. and not the father. However, Justices Kairu, Nyamwea, and Odunga were of the view that the rights of a child supersede one's marital status. They argued that there is no rational justification to prove that a child born in a marriage has a higher claim to wealth than one who is born outside matrimony. To deny children born out of wedlock the benefits which accrues to other children born in wedlock based on the alleged sins committed by their parents, in our view, cannot be justified. It was a unanimous decision, and they said it would mean that this court would be adopting hurtful discrimination and stereotypical response to a clear case of discrimination, according to the bench headed by Justice Cairo. Culture that denies such a child his or her otherwise right to parental care and protection on the ground of marital status of a father and the mother cannot be countenanced. Mm. So, at the heart of the case was the estate of the late Mombasa tycoon Salim Juma Hakim, who died without a will on the 23rd of February 2015 in Tanzania. The tycoon engaged in the oil business and had a Blue Jay petrol, petrol station in Diani. His estate also comprised the lorry property in Kilifi and Diani and four bank accounts. Three months after his death, his widow Ruby Mwawasi mm. and her sister Judith Malele filed for succession before the High Court. On the other hand, Fatuma Athman filed a case before the Kadhis court as Juma's widow. Mm -hmm. Upon realizing that Mawasi had filed a succession case before the high court, Athman also moved to the same court and lodged a claim saying that she was the lawful wife. She said she married the deceased in, in August 26, 2006 and had four children. Mawasi was a stranger according to her and her children could not inherit anything yeah. as they were born before she got married to Juma. Well, the court said no. All of them, whether born within the law of religion or mm. outside, will inherit from their father. Eh. It's a big one. It's a straightforward one as far as I'm concerned. Even with me, I'm just wondering, why is this matter in the court of appeal? Because it's always been an issue. Children have never... Parents... Par we, okay, if somebody dies, right? Now, remember, it's not the mother. It's the father. But for the longest time, a child born out of wedlock going to claim before court that this child should also seek inheritance from the deceased has never been given a part of the pie from the courts. Ah, if it has been agreed family and a communal agreement, that's different. But having been taken to court, it has always been, okay, well... Religion dictates that you cannot then um, from the Catholic courts, yes, or from these other courts, from because Kathis, we have very many cases Kathis, of people going to court. This is specifically Kathis, right? Uh. And they say you, you, it's the, it's according to our religion. It is the father. You cannot inherit from your father if you were born out of marriage. Mm. 
court says, well, court of appeal says, because this case was child is taken. child. Yeah, child is child. <laughs> eh. Okay. Yeah. So Raila is back. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Hey, the last time we had Raila was in twenty what seventeen. <laughs> He's, <laughs> back. <laughs> mm. He's back. He's <clears throat> back. Uh, mm. So basically, you heard the, the statement that Raila released last week, questioning this G2G story mm. and saying G2G and uh, Ruto saying, "Look, you don't ask us to prove that G2G is G2G. <laughs> If you have any contrary evidence, prove that G2G is not G2G. It's a problem." Now, Okio Mtata as well came up with all these uh, statements saying, you know, I'm looking at how money was withdrawn from the consolidated fund. Now those two have met in the same classroom and they have said, yes, we are in agreement. We are forwarding this same, same answer to the examiner. Mm. Yeah? He had asked for proof. Mm. We are sending it to him. We are sending this same, same answer to the examiner. Mm. Basically, what the claim here is eh, that the budget that was approved in 2022-2023 the budget that ended in june this year mm. had uh, allocated some money uh, to the uh, ministry of petroleum but the ministry ended up spending some 43 billion shillings drawn from the consolidated fund and another 20 billion that had been raised by the ministry's internal operations without approval by mp's with the ministry calling up article 223 of the constitution to access these funds uh, According to budget documents some of the money was used to pay subsidies to private financial enterprises okay there mm. lies the tale mm. so these subsidies to private financial enterprises is where now the question comes in let's get the details of these private financial enterprises the controller of budget authorized withdrawal of 42.7 billion by the ministry under article 223 of which 26 billion was for petroleum pump stabilization and another 16.6 billion 16.6 billion Million. round it off it comes to 17 billion there you go Does that sound familiar? to cater for the compensation of oil importers <laughs> are we there we are there are we there yes mama busia senator kiomtata claims that these funds were used in the importation of that 17 billion oil cargo whose saga has unsettled different ministries mm. so <laughs> saying this private uh, in, 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 which were being compensated for the importation and they are not part of the fuel stabilization mechanism so who are they mm. probably this a uh, lady called what's her name anjeri 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 i concur with senator omtata's suspicion that anjeri is the private financial enterprises that were funded by the 17 billion shillings illegally withdrawn from the consolidated fund and received by the ministry of petroleum so he's saying uh can uh, this gentleman called uh, shushir uh, the other gentleman called professor dungu uh please explain but first of all they remove themselves, themselves from, office. from office yes <laughs> okay. as you're explaining just as you're explaining down at home. you know this saga you know what it reminds me of mm. <laughs> the aroki morer dam saga mm. just the manner in which this story is building up mm. the explanations being given mm. uh, it's this don't worry it moved here mm. and then it's, it's only 7 billion, billion. it's not as opposed to mm, mm. Yeah. Mm. yes eurocopters all these things mm. Mm. so here we are again <laughs> in familiar territory yes yes i'm telling yeah. you but then if indeed the this was a scheme and the owners of the scheme are people who had played the long game like this how would they get caught what would it blow not up not only that if it was a budget that started last year yeah. it wasn't ruto's budget was it no it wasn't no ruto's ruto's budget uhuru's budget was 5.9 yes but then ruto's administration Added. increased it using article 22 of the constitution There Choice. you go. Where you spend then, then, then we can then explain later. later. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You behave then you ask for forgiveness later. Yeah. later. yeah. yeah. Okay. So Mansky, if they're playing the long game, the long game, why were they caught? Uh, why why is How that? How can they be No, the catching is the short term. Uh, long term they'll get away. Touche. <laughs> 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 okay. Keep it here for more. Good morning at 7 a.m.
blows up your life. Good morning. This is the news wire. I'm Lea Ubaga. President William Ruto says that Kenya and France relations have grown steadily over the years, resulting in increased uh, trade. Speaking after holding talks with Pre- France President Emmanuel Macron, Ruto said that they'd signed an agreement that would see both countries grow their cooperation to other areas such as infrastructure, climate change, and regional peace efforts. He further said that with other world leaders that discussed how to invest in renewable energy to transform Africa, the world, and create jobs for millions of youths. This event comes as Ruto left the country for Germany as he informed Kenyans that he'd gone to secure jobs for them. Today marks 220 days since cult leader Paul McKenzie was arrested and he's yet to be charged. All his 28 co-accused have spent more than 150 days in custody, apart from his wife Rhoda Mumbua, who is out on 400,000 shillings bone terms. McKenzie's lawyer Wycliffe Makasembo has however told the court that the continued detention on his clients by the state is tantamount to abuse of their rights. McKenzie and his associates are accused of the deaths of 429 persons whose bodies have been exhumed from Shakahola Forest. They are facing multiple charges including terrorism, murder, aiding suicide, abduction, radicalization, genocide, crimes against humanity and money laundering. Shanzu's senior principal magistrate Yusuf Shikanda is expected to deliver a ruling on the application on December 22nd. <laughs> kila wakati nikijaribu ku, kuomba hata nifunguliwe jua jua hata hata masaa haiwezekani mimi niko ndani kwa ndani naumia maumivu nateseka na baridi na sisikizo na mtu nataka niende nikalilie wapi tena but what I've been told is just a general blanket application give us time to do what to accomplish what an 85-year-old mother has allegedly been killed by her sons over land dispute at a village in Yamira County. Area Chief Beatrice Musa says the body of the woman was found with several cuts on various parts of her body. She adds that the suspects have been detained at Nyamira Police Station as investigations into the incident continue. <laughs> Alafu kwa shingo kulikuwa na jeraha la panga ni kama alikuwa amekatwa. Ako na vijana wawili, kuna mchukua alisema aongee na mama. So atakaulizwa mbona basi mkaenda kuangalia mrango mbona iko wazi saa nne. Kama muongee na yeye, kuna mmoja alisema ndiye alienda wa kwanza, akaita mama hakuitika, kaenda kuita mwingine ndio wakakuja kuangalia sasa ni nini. 301 kilos of marijuana estimated to be worth 1 million shillings have been impounded by police officers in Bomet County. Police say they've launched a manhunt on the driver who managed to escape, leaving his vehicle behind. Six years after Salai Dam bust killing 48 people and leaving a trail of destruction, the ODPP has sought to have the criminal case withdrawn. Under a certificate of urgency, the ODPP said that the victims and those accused had reached an out-of-court settlement with families who lost adults getting 1.2 million shillings and minors 800,000 shillings from the farm owner. The magistrate will issue a ruling on the matter tomorrow. Catholic Church of Eldoret Archbishop Dominic Kimengich has called on the government to map out dangerous regions as a result of the ongoing floods. Kimengich says this will help residents quickly move to safer grounds to avoid deaths and losses incurred from the El Nino rains. Tuwe na yo umakini, kuna sehemu ambazo wakati kinyesha sana, inaasa kubaromoka, kama unajua kumbo wanaishi maala ambapo inaasa kubaromoka, basi watafuta usalama maala ambapo iko sawa sawa. Wafadhali kufanya hivyo kuliko poteza maisha na tunaomba sana pia serikali wasaidie watu wetu waongeleshe watu ili wa, wa, wajikinge na kuwa kuenda mahali ambapo hapa kwa na matara ay, madhara yoyote advising parents on the long holiday the bishop has encouraged them to, to to take responsibility of raising their children by being aware of their daily activities tukiwa oh, jamaa tukiwa familia jirani tusaidie watoto wetu jirani ukiona mtoto ameenda njia mbazi mzuri ni vizuri kumkemea huyo mtoto na kusahisha yeye tutafute njia ambayo tunaweza kushirikiana zaidi katika hali ya kutunza watoto wetu na kuhakikisha kwamba wako na maadili ambayo 
itasaidia hawa watoto wetu wakue na kuwa watu wazima that's the news wire i'm lea ubaga Spice FM, Nakuru. All right, with the rain still coming down, we're still looking at uh, a situation where traffic will be crazy. It's already doing just so on the Thika Superhighway. Coming in from way past uh, Githurai, heavy traffic, then touching on the outer ring junction and then out towards uh, Survey and the Pangani underpass. Kiambu Road has also packed up quite some. And we're looking at in and outbound traffic on Limuru Road this morning. It's coming in heavy from... Um, United Nations Avenue and then coming in all the way from Kitisuru so that's one to watch we're also looking at what may then pop off coming off Waiakiwe and there's some traffic already heading out towards Westlands alright uh, as you're coming on Jogorod it's bumper to bumper through towards the city stadium junction and we're also seeing that traffic has started to build on Mombasa Road heading out towards the Nyaya Stadium um, roundabout junction so let's uh, see what happens. We're getting into traffic hours soon. Let's open up and talk about what's going on where you are, just in case you find a good route that folks can use. And we'll talk on Spice FM KE on X. This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is The Situation Room. The only way to start your day. Seven minutes after seven, we are on to the second hour of Kenya's biggest conversation. Happy Tuesday, 21st day of November 2023. And January is coming and school fees will be a story in a few weeks' time. But don't worry, we got you. Because mm. we're stepping up and we're shining with Kiwi. <clears throat> so we know that January is going to be a difficult one. We know that already. So Kiwi says, you know what, plan ahead and start to buy Kiwi today. Walk into a supermarket where you will find the new logo tin. Uh, make your purchase yeah. and then you dial star four five nine star five hash okay yes and then under the lid there'll be a code you input that as you're doing your dialing you win airtime or data instantly and then you get a chance to enter into the draw get this four people every week are winning thirty five thousand shillings yeah and it's two odd school fees so just let's note that every week every week four, four winners four winners of, of thirty five thousand bob. bob so some each. people have already gotten their school fees for january sorted wow because they did what they bought kiwi exactly and don't worry if you do not win this week your draw you're still moved into the next week's draw could be you okay yes so as long as you've bought as long as you haven't won you are still participating in, the in draw. future draws once you win out of the draw yeah but that is once this particular code that you bought one to the teen of kiwi wins out but if you bought like three you still have a chance for the other two yes 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 hey how what are the odds of somebody winning something like that i witnessed something bizarre mm. well not bizarre but something that's quite interesting on friday so there was this event and there was a raffle mm -hmm. okay you know, you go, you pick a raffle ticket, and then you're holding your number, and your number is number 14, and then the others are in the bowl. And so I was conducting this raffle, and there are several winners. You are conducting the raffle. Yeah, as long as I'm seeing the raffle. Yeah, <laughs> oh, the raffle okay. it? No, 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 no. <laughs> you yes. are conducting the raffle. Go on. Yes. You have my attention. So we have 10 winners, right? <laughs> Winner number one, number two, number three. And the prices get juicy and heavy. Uh, the prices uh, get... Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's this one gentleman who kept saying, hey, me, 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 me. My number, my number, 14. And we were like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then 14 came yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So after him being very vocal, we went to him and said, all right, so you're the one who's going out to dip your hand in the bowl. But first thing, this number 14 of yours, can you give somebody to hold it? 
Let's see what number you pick. He pick picks 14. number 14. No way. <laughs> yes, he did. What are the odds? Hmm? Imagine. <laughs> Those are not odds. Eric should tell us. <laughs> tell us. Who that all was. the papers in the thing. Yeah, remember how this story 14. started? Eric was, was running the, the raffle. Conducting, <laughs> conducting the raffle. Conducting the raffle. And there was that accomplice of his. Number 14. <laughs> There's usually number a guy 14. in the crowd. <laughs> number 14. And they didn't know each other. But number 14. <laughs> If they were playing the long game, <laughs> how were they caught? <laughs> I tell you, in that particular boat, they were just number 14. Was, that's what I'm telling you. Every piece of paper was labeled 14. Uh, anyway. Uh, so, um, the next conversation we want to have is on impeachments, okay? So, recently we were treated to a revision of the drama in the Senate. Reoccurrence. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, the recurrence of the drama in the Senate with the second round impeachment of uh, Governor of Meru County, Kawera Mwangaza. Okay, mm. and we saw we saw what was presented by the County Assembly. We talked to the, some of the representatives of the County Assembly even before the matter went to the Senate. We saw what was uh, being presented in the Senate. One of the advocates that was representing, that was in the team that was for Kawera Mwangaza, is Elisha Ongoya. He is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and a senior lecturer at Kabarak University. He's our guest. Good morning, Okili. Good morning, Eric. How are you? Very well. Yes. Welcome to Kenya's hot seat. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. mm. Now, City has the day's proverb, and this week's proverbs are from? Namibia. Namibia. Yes, yes. The Republic of Namibia. Please remind us the name of the president. The name of the president, he's called Hage mm. Gengob. Now, I am reading it as it is written. Mm. If it is called Hedge, that is okay, but mm. it's written Hage. Hage okay. Gengob. Yes, Gengob is written Gengob. G E I N G O B. Mm. Can't pronounce it any other way. Mm. If there's another way it's pronounced, I will be informed, but mm. I'm reading it as it is. Then he has a vice president. It's called Nangolo. Why, why, why are you guys sniggering? So why don't you let me read the name? Go on. Please, let carry me continue. On. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Mbumba. M B U M B A Bumba. Then mm -hmm. you have the Prime Minister Nangolo. That's the VP. Prime Minister is called Sarah Kavunagelwa. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Then you also have the a, Chief Justice. No, the deputy <laughs> the Deputy Prime Minister. Chief the Jessica, deputy. Yes, the Deputy Prime Minister is called Metumbo Nandi. Simple, straightforward name. Then you have the Chief Justice. Now him, simple, straightforward name. It's called Peter Sivute. You see? Okay. Hmm. And with these heavy duty African names with alliterations. Hmm. Just Peter Sivute. The law is very clear. Mm. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> 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 What's the proverb then? The proverb mm. is a little rain each day will fill the rivers to overflowing. <laughs> okay, what's the proverb? <laughs> the proverb the, this is what happens when, when it rains. <laughs> <laughs> the proverb for today is a little rain will fill the rivers to overflow. A little rain will fill the rivers each day. Just a each little day. rain each, each day, day will, will fill, fill the, the rivers, rivers to overflowing. To overflowing. Okay. Wakili well, Alicia, mm -hmm. what's your interpretation of this proverb? I mean, it sounds pretty obvious, doesn't it? You know, uh, uh, one of the things I, I fear the most was that I'll be asked to interpret a proverb because I have never interpreted proverbs in my lifetime. But uh, it would be the equivalent of what the Swahili say, Haba na haba hujaza kibaba. Mm. See? A man who interprets proverbs so accurately is afraid to interpret <laughs> proverbs. <laughs> Surely. Mm. Mm. <laughs> as, as you put it, the law is simple. Mm. It's very clear. Very clear. Mm. Very clear. It's very, very clear. <laughs> <laughs> Wakili, we saw you mm -hmm. on our TV sets mm -hmm. and you were in the Senate. Uh -huh. For whom were you acting? Well, I was doing what I do for a living. Uh, teaching. Um, <laughs> I keep reminding everybody that, you know, I don't roast maize on, a road, on the roadside for a living. Uh, <laughs> I do precisely that. <laughs> Not in a cleaner job. It's actually a dirtier job than uh, uh, any other job you can imagine. Mm. But uh, I was privileged to be retained by Kawira Mangaza's legal team <clears throat> to lead them. Uh, in the in in prosecuting her case to the lead Senate. the legal team, yeah, to lead the legal team. What does that mean? Uh, there's a way the profession works. Mm. Uh, legal profession is uh, that uh, um, 
different people have different uh, specializations, like another profession, of course. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, there is a moment when <coughs> you can uh, call on a lawyer of particular seniority to lead you in a particular case or in a particular aspect of a particular case. Mm. So, uh, courtesy of my years of investment in uh, constitutional litigation and considering the constitutional attributes in uh, impeachment process, uh, I was called upon to lead uh, the, the legal team. The legal team had uh, eight lawyers and one legal assistant. So I was uh, called in to lead uh, these seven lawyers and one legal assistant. So I was the lead counsel in that matter. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes. Have you participated in a previous impeachment? No, no, no. This yes. was the first uh, impeachment. Uh, there have been uh, 14 impeachments of governors in this country. This is the 14th, actually, since the inception of the Constitution of Kenya 2010. Mm. So I haven't been in the other 13. Mm. So I was in the 14th. Mm. So finally, you got the chance to actually now test this part of the Constitution. <laughs> yes, uh, it's Directly. an area I have researched in, I have written on. So um, I guess that's partly why I was uh, consulted in the matter. It's a matter, an area I've touched on, I, I have uh, researched on, I have done presentations on in uh, other events. So I guess that's how uh, uh, I was called upon. To mm. play did did your research idea. match experience? Um, the experience of it all? Not, I mean... I, I guess uh, there's no point when research completely matches experience. Mm. Research helps um, in, in testing the experience, mm. but there's no point in time when research completely matches experience. Uh, young people teach me all the ground that uh, reality that on the ground things are different. Mm. So the experience is on the ground. But, but we thank God that at the end of it all, our argument prevailed. Mm. Yes. What's your outlook? Let's look at impeachment as an overarching principle. Yes. Uh, in the country today. Mm. Um, on mm. one side of it, it would look as though it's being used as a tool mm. for political conflict. Mm. On the other side, uh, safeguard of the constitution mm. to make sure that individuals don't go into excesses. Mm. Um, how do you see it being practiced yes, or yes. coming to life mm. in Kenya today? Okay. Before we get into the details. To understand impeachment, you must, unta you must understand power generally. Uh, when I was a young university student, I was taught law by Professor J.B. Ojuang. And uh, those were the days when uh, people were clamoring for the removal of the Kanu establishment and uh, the Moi regime. And uh, Professor Juang was a fairly, if I may, conservative jurist. Mm -hmm. He used to tell, you know, people used to say, let's amend the constitution, let's reduce presidential power. And he told us oftentimes that this is a very simplistic argument. Every time you give somebody functions, you must give that person power to perform those functions. So that the clamor for reduced presidential power as if it's an end in itself is, uh, <laughs> is naive. Mm. That power must vest somewhere. You can't remove power and throw it into the ocean. Mm. That power must vest somewhere. And power can be abused wherever vested. The fact that you are removing it from the president does not immunize it from abuse. Mm. Wherever you will vest it, it can be abused there. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, he advocated for a more wholesome view of how we look at power. That uh, if you disperse power, you must disperse functions as well. Because power can't be allowed to idle. Number two, it's also the nature of power that it must be exercised by human beings. Mm. And uh, all the philosophers taught us that if uh, governments were run by angels, I mean, sorry, if all men were angels, mm. then there would be no need for government. Mm. We need government because men are not angels. Sadly, it is those men who are not angels who constitute government. <laughs> and that's the obscenity of the whole situation. Mm. And um, government therefore becomes what we call a necessary evil. Government is actually essentially an evil. Mm. But that evil is necessary. Because if you allow human beings to run their affairs without this evil, mm. then uh, the outcome will be, will be tragic. More so, evil will prevail. So impeachments must be viewed in that context. Mm. That we have reached a condition, a situation in human relations where we have agreed that uh, power must check power. Mm. When you vest power in a particular office, mm. you must vest another power to check this power. Only power checks power. Mm. So, um, a number of things have happened in our design of the Constitution. We have created offices and vested those offices with certain uh, immunities and certain powers 
for example, we establish the office of judge, mm. and we say the nature of the work of a judge is that it must be conducted without external interference. Mm. So how do you guarantee this? One of the things you do is to give that judge security of tenure. We tell no, you do what you have got to do because eh, you are guaranteed your term of office up to the time you get 74 years. Mm. But then you realize that this judge is also an angel, it's not an angel. He or she too can abuse power. Mm. So you qualify that guarantee. You tell that judge, you know, you have security of tenor, but security of tenor during good behavior. Mm. Mm. So that you have secure, good behavior tenor. Mm. And so we also elect the president and say, no, no, you, ha- you are guaranteed a term of five years once elected with a possibility of renewal for further five years. But again, this five years is guaranteed subject to good behavior. Mm. Then a question arises, what do we do in the event of bad behavior? You must provide a remedy. Mm-hmm. If you provide a right without a remedy, then that right is hollow. Mm-hmm. So the remedy in this circumstance say, look, the process of getting a governor or a president in office is through popular mandate. Mm. But the economics of popular mandate is too expensive. Mm. By the time you go to elections and get somebody into office, it's an extremely costly affair. Mm. So if removing them has to go through the same process, it is not sustainable. Ideally, that's the way it should be. Mm. Ideally, if we are living in a perfect space, mm-hmm. then to remove this person, it's we possibly same, have same to go through the same process. Prove- but you can imagine the cost implications. Yeah. It's actually un- unsustainable. Yeah. So we go for the second better alternative through use of delegated mandate. Mm-hmm. To say, this popular mandate that we exercise gives us delegates, members of parliament, senators, MCA. So we can now use delegated sovereignty mm. to exercise this removal from office. Mm. So that is the, the way in which this power is checked, the power of the governor through the impeachment process. There are multiple other prescriptions in the law mm. for checking the powers of governors, mm. the external functions of governors. But impeachment is just one of them. It's actually the ultimate it must be used as a last resort. It's a last resort. Because there are other lesser restrictive measures Mm -hmm. that I will allude to in the course of this conversation. So this is a last resort. When you are completely incorrigible, then we remove you from office. Otherwise, as I've said, there are other methods that we can check the governor. Let's go to those ones. Yes. One, you know very well that we go to court every day and challenge presidential actions. Yes. So we don't remove the president. Mm. You appoint somebody, we just go to court and quash that appointment. And uh, that's it. You just mm. remain in office, but your appointee has been removed. Mm. That's a method of checking you. Mm. We have power. The mm. power of the judiciary mm. has checked presidential power, has checked the governor's power. Yeah. Parliament makes laws. We just go to court and nullify them for being unconstitutional. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We have checked parliament's power. We have not recalled the parliamentarians. So this is one. Number mm. two, you know that um, the governor uh, needs resources to run his or her government. And uh, to get these resources, you must get approval of these resources by the county assembly through yeah. the budget process. Yeah. So that's another way. You can just refuse to approve the budget if you discover that the manner in which the resources are being appropriated is not consistent with the aspirations of the county in question. Number three, uh, you have um, things uh, such as the Auditor General periodically comes and just audits mm. the books of accounts of the county mm. and by law the auditor general must submit their reports of county audits to the county assembly and uh, the the national parliament all of them without exception mm. okay. uh, so that's another way you have the controller of budget the mm. controller of budget must check the manner in which resources are removed from the county revenue fund before mm. you use the budget this re- this withdrawal of money this use of this money for paying salaries and so forth must be approved by the controller of budget so these are methods through which power is checked yeah. that are less restrictive mm-hmm. by the time you go to removing somebody from office this person must be incorrigible and this is the case we made before the senate mm. that um if i came to this studio and wanted to nitpick I'll find errors this morning, just mm. from the things you have done here. Mm. I'll find that there are protocols laid down by this organization that w- if I were technical, I'll pick one or two that you have already breached. Mm. That's not a ground for removing you from office. There could be just internal memos mm. that can be circulated here to tell you how we can do things better. Mm. Or just peer meetings among yourselves to review each other after this meeting mm. to say, no, no, we, we, tomorrow we are going to do things differently. By the time we come to terminating your services here, you must be incorrigible. That's the point that we are, we are making. So uh, we, as the governor's team, didn't think that the assembly had proved incorrigibility. Fortunately for us, 
the senator agreed with us. Okay. Yes. I like this word. Yes. Incorrigible. Yes. Mm. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are beyond repair by the conventional lesser restrictive methods. You, you can't be repaired by those ones. So then, based on that, <laughs> yes. are you essentially saying that uh, the motions of impeachment that we've seen wielded, the yes. last 14, yes. then essentially is akin to using a sledgehammer to kill a mosquito? Out of the 14 impeachments that have reached the Senate. We're talking about the that have reached the Senate. Yeah. Mm. The ones that have been attempted at county government level, I don't think, I've, I think I lost count. Yeah, there are quite a number. Yeah, there yeah. are quite a number. Mm. I, I suspect every county assembly throws some impeachment threat at a governor at some point in, in time. Mm. But the ones that have reached Senate were 14. Out of those 14, only three have been approved mm -hmm. by Senate. Mm -hmm. 11 have not been approved by Senate. They have failed the, the standard. Um, there, there are other perspectives I'll, I'll reflect on as, as we get along, but mm -hmm. uh, we discovered Senate has two options when you present an impeachment uh, motion before it. Mm -hmm. One, it can uh, subject the matter to an investigation by an 11 member committee. Yeah. <coughs> or two, it can investigate the matter as a whole house. Uh, before Kawira, there had been 13 impeachment attempts at Senate. Mm -hmm. Out of those 13, three had been considered by the whole house and uh, 10 had been sent to the committees. All the 10 that were sent to the committee stage uh, never saw the light of day. Mm. They were disapproved. The three that had been considered by the whole house had been approved, mm. uh, which is why we were a bit apprehensive. You know, <laughs> those of you who are soccer fans, you know, mm. statistics count. Mm. Mm. When the Senate approved a uh, consideration by the whole house, of course, that statistic was against the governor because yep. of previous history. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, as a person in the position I occupied, is you marshal your team and tell them, you know what, we have a role to play. Our role is to make the best case possible out mm. of the situation. Then the decision maker is somebody else. Never give up. Never give up. However, this body called the Senate, mm. all right, as it's getting the report from the County Assembly and yes. being told this is what the County Assembly has brought forth yes. as charges for impeaching a certain governor. Mm. What is their role? The is Senate. theirs just a simply a political role or do they have some legal mandate? Yes. Um, fortunately for us, a number of matters involving impeachments of governors have found their way through the courts. And now our courts, by design of our constitution, are the ultimate interpreters of the constitution. The mm. ultimate. All of us are interpreters of the constitution, even you. Mm. As you sit here, you look the at Article 34 and say, uh, there is something called media rights. Mm. What are my rights within this framework? You are interpreting it, but your interpretation is not ultimate. Mm. The ultimate interpretation is that given by the court. So courts have given us guidance on this matter. The role of the Senate is jud quasi judicial. Okay. It's judicial. So the Senate is a trial forum. It's a forum where you go for a hearing mm -hmm. and the Senate is supposed to apply its mind to a constitutionally prescribed criteria that the charges must pass a particular threshold before the Senate approves them. Now, Senate can approve charges that don't pass that criteria. Mm. Just like any power user or power person vested with power can abuse power. Mm. But the advantage we have is that the decision of the Senate is itself subject to judicial review. You can carry it to court mm. and ask, Senate has said this ground passed this threshold. Was Senate right or wrong? in making that determination and sometimes courts agree and set aside or quash senate's approval but then you see mm. when a matter is before court mm. the judicial officer will have to justify the reason yes. for holding or disapproving yes. what's been brought before them yes senate doesn't have that uh, it appears senate, the senate only has to vote mm -hmm. I yes. and the individual votes of the senate don't have to come with a reason i don't have to explain why i'm saying yes to yes. impeach or no Correct. Uh, there are two, two, well, that's partly correct. What you've said is partly correct. Mm. It's partly wrong. If Senate, <laughs> if Senate resolves to take the impeachment trial to an 11 member committee, the committee must generate a committee report. Yeah. A report must have reasons. Yeah. So um, that's why a lot of us who go 
who, who, are, who are controlled this prefer the committee, the committee way. Route. Because there's a report. There's mm. something you can look at and say, well, here I think, yeah, they understood me. Here they got me wrong. Okay. When it goes through plenary, there is no opportunity for a report. There is a vote. Mm -hmm. But even when there is a vote, there is an assumption that that vote is based on the logic, on the grounds advanced, on the evidence in support of those grounds, and also taking into account on the objections to those grounds and the evidence in support of the defense against those grounds. Okay. Yes. There is a document we keep hearing called the Hansard. Yes. What does it do exactly? A Hansard is just a verbatim record of what happens in some uh -huh. yes. So now, can that record not be used to cobble up a report? You know, um, <laughs> at the end of it all, once the vote is taken, mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no report in the sense in which I'm referring to a report. You know, when a committee prepares a report, it's an actual document called a report. Yeah. When the but is the report not a factor of the deliberations? It is. It is. Yes. And there's an analysis and yes. then some conclusion. Yes. But... When people vote, yes. is that vote not a conclusion of the deliberations? Well, um, when uh, the Speaker reads count one mm. in the full sitting of Senate, uh, as happened in Kawira's case, people go onto their machines and pass a vote. Yep. No one in their vote says, I am voting because I'm because. convinced by this argument mm. that Ongoya made. They just, or by, they just yeah. vote. Yeah. Mm. Unlike in the committee way, where people will say, we received the following arguments yeah. for. We received the following arguments okay. against. We believed this argument for the following reason. Mm. So, so that is the, that's the report that I'm talking about. So technically, yes. Um, but the okay, answer, before yes. the depressing of that button, yes. whether it's red, green, or yellow, there's yes, some yes. debate. Thank you. Yes. But not by every member. Yes, yes. But it is by choice. It's, it's, I mean, are members prohibited from uh, proferring an opinion? They are not. They are. They are technically. They, they are not prohibited in the sense that you use it, but because of time constraints, they could be. There are people who can. You may not catch the speaker's eye. Yes, that's it. Or even if you catch the speaker's <laughs> eye, but there are so many people because nowadays it's technology, mm. and he picks the first five, and the rest of the Don't forty, the forty, the forty-two of you uh, didn't get a chance. That's as far as it goes. Unlike the committee where you actually retreat. You are booked somewhere where you deliberate. Your only business to deliberate. Where everybody will have their voice heard. You generate a draft report. People reread it to confirm that, no, no, we can correct that and so forth. Mm -hmm. After the time, they come up with a formal report. So I, I, I still suggest that we, we okay. need to reconsider. Okay. The, yes. Allow me. Yes. Forgive me. I keep interrupting you. Yes. This time that isn't enough. Yes. How can it be increased? Because yeah. we're saying there's only time for five. Yes. Can we increase this time so that at least... We can. If you yes. followed my final submissions in Kawira Mangaza's case, I proposed a reform of the rules of the house so that we have more time. Uh, first, that time is uh, there in the standing orders of the house and parliament can amend the standing orders at any time. Uh, number two, the advantage we have is that we have now tested this thing. You know, when you, when you make rules in abstract, mm. you may think two days, three days are adequate. This time round, by the way, things were made worse. We were supposed to have three days before Senate. On the third day, coincided with the president's address mm. to the Johnson of Parliament. Oh. So it was removed. Mm. So we were, what we were supposed to do in three days was squeezed in two days. Now again, you see, those are circumstances beyond uh, your control. It just mm. coincided mm. with the, the two events. And th they are both important events. The law prescribes from the time the impeachment by the county assembly happens, mm. the flow of events up to the time the Senate finishes its, its proceedings. On the other hand, the Constitution provides the President's address mm. to the joint sitting of Parliament, and the two coincided. Mm. And therefore, they had to remove one day. A and therefore, yeah, I, that time can be increased by parliamentary uh, interventions. Mm. We are hoping that the senators who are directly affected because their voice was not heard are in a vantage position to propose amendments to um, uh, the standing orders of the House mm. so that time is, is enhanced. We are also hoping that those of us, I sitting here, one of them, uh, you'll exercise our power to petition Parliament and say, look, we have now tested this process of yours and it's punitive. Let us see how we can, can we enhance see how this else time. we can do this. Yes. Mm. 26 minutes to 8. We're taking this break now. Elisha Ngoya is a lawyer, an advocate of the High Court, a senior lecturer at the Kabarak University. He was in the Kawera Mwangaza defense team in the Senate. He's here giving us his experience from constitutional law and his understanding of the law and also his experience with this particular impeachment.
how impeachment has been conducted in this country. Wakili, Kiwi. Mayona. I don't need to remind you or to even introduce Kiwi to you. You know Kiwi. Tango ni tango utotoni. Tango utotoni. And you know what Kiwi does. Now this particular tin of Kiwi, you see it has a starburst, it has some beautiful marembesho marembesho here. This one is because there's a particular promotion going on. Okay. Go buy Kiwi. Uh-huh. Open Kiwi tin. Under the lid, you will find a code. This code come to the starburst. Follow the instructions. It will tell you dial star four five nine star five hash. Then you'll in insert that code. Immediately you get airtime or data, and then also immediately you get into a weekly draw for thirty-five thousand shillings worth of school fees. Four winners per week, every week. Mm -hmm. How many more weeks to go? Still many more weeks many. to go. Okay. Still have time. In these hard economic times, that's yes. quite attractive. Something, right? <laughs> Buy more than one. Nominate various people <laughs> <laughs> to, to benefit from their school fees. 25 to 8, we'll be back shortly. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. If a lion shows you its teeth, it doesn't mean it likes you. <laughs> it doesn't mean it likes you. Mm. It won't start. <laughs> <laughs> a liar calls as witness one who is either dead or far away. Say it in Below, you know this uh, character called a uh, liar. He has disturbed people. Mm -hmm. So when you tell him, uh, who are your witnesses? He will take you to a place where it is difficult to verify. For someone like me who sweats uh, a lot, <laughs> I cannot survive there. <laughs> you know, sweating is biblical. Good. And he must blame it on Adam, not me. You know, because Adam messed up and, uh, and, and he was told, now you fellow, you, by the sweat of your brow, oh, yes. <laughs> thou shall eat. <laughs> the Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation. The rain is still coming down in Nairobi. It's 16 degrees. We'll see highs of 21 and lows of 15 today. It's also raining in Nakuru at 17 and the same in Yeri at 17. 15 cloudy rain showers in Eldoret with highs of 21 and lows of 14. And we're looking into a cloudy Mombasa still with rain at 26 with highs of 30. And we'll see highs of 31 in a cloudy Malindi at 26. Um, Kisumu, cloudy at 20 and it's also raining in Kakamega at 17. We're looking into a rainy Kampala, heavy rain at 19 and Dar es Salaam partly cloudy at 25 with highs of 31. Mogadishu sunny at 27 and Addis is sunny at 14. Uh, Johannesburg cloudy with more rain expected this morning at uh, going to highs of 29. It's clear at 25 in Lagos with highs of 33 and raining in Kinshasa at 24. It will go to highs of 30. Okay, so this morning, if you just happen to be um, along Lunga Lunga, very busy. It's in and outbound traffic. It's touching a little bit on the Likoni interchange as you come towards the southern bypass. And um, we're also seeing heavy traffic on Jogo Road this morning, not letting up as you get towards um, Landis. Landis, a lot of traffic heading out towards Kamkunji. Let's take a look at the Thika Superhighway where traffic is heavier than heavy. I don't even know what this is. It's traffic all the way through to the outer ring at Junction. And well in before that, Githurai, then heading into the CBD. Kiambu Road is inching further away from Muthaiga Square. That means a lot of traffic this morning. To get out of this one, it will be no mean feat. All right. And also uh, still heavy coming off of um, United Nations Avenue. So we're into traffic hour proper now. Let's see what happens as we get closer to 8. Let's talk on Spice FM KE on X. Spice up your life. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice Our FM, Nairobi. For the next 21 minutes with advocate Alicia Ongoya. City has stepped out for a meeting. Kidogo, we'll be back in the conversation as it continues. Well, there are several things that you've said this morning. Mm -hmm. More than once. Yes. 
we have tested this thing. Yes. We have tested this thing. Mm. And now maybe it's about time we start having a conversation about <laughs> what's our experience mm. now with yes. the impeachment process. Mm. And also you talked about, I mean, it's power versus function mm. and safeguarding those things by having mm. systems of checks and balances. Mm. Let me begin by asking, because we've heard this uh, several times on fr from several quarters. Mm. Do you think county assemblies are abusing their power or have gotten to a point where there have been instances of abusing their power mm. to check the county executive through impeachment? Yes. Um, there is a, an old French philosopher called Baron de Montesquieu who taught us that constant experience teaches us that every person vested with power is apt to abuse that power and to carry on with that abuse <laughs> until they are met with checks. And uh, therefore, um, it's, it's not um, unusual for me to say that, yes, in certain circumstances, county assemblies have abused their, their power uh, to uh, uh, impeach the governors. <clears throat> and um, how the, the justification is not hard to come by because uh, if out of uh, 14 attempts mm -hmm. that have reached Senate, mm -hmm. only three have gone through, what does that tell us? about what Senate's own view has been over the manner in which uh, county assemblies have used that power in uh, the 11 or so other attempts. Mm. <laughs> and remember, I'm not talking about those that have not reached Senate. We know even from just media reports, there are many circumstances where members of county assemblies tell governors that you either give us this or else or we, we remove yes. you. Now, mm. the power of impeachment was never meant to be used as a tool of bargain mm. Mm. by county assemblies for anything. Why do I say this? The Constitution specifies the grounds for impeachment. Specifies. Mm -hmm. says there must be gross violation mm. of the Constitution. Okay. There must be serious reason to believe mm. that the governor has committed a crime under national or international law. Mm. There must be abuse of office or gross misconduct. Or the governors must be laboring under such physical and mental infirmity mm. that he is now incapable of discharging the functions of office. Those are the only grounds mm. that the question recognizes. Now, I have posed this question before I'll pose it here. Why not just violation of the Constitution? Mm. Why not just reason to believe that the governor has committed a crime? Why does the lawmaker or the drafter insist on gross, gross. violation of the Constitution, mm. gross misconduct? Why not just misconduct? Mm. It tells you that the framer of the law begins by appreciating that to assume the office of governor, to go to that office, is serious business. First, it is exercise of the people's sovereignty mm. as specified in Article 1 of the Constitution. And that exercise of people's power should not be easily interfered with by delegates. So that if a delegate has to step in, and by delegates I mean members of the Senate and members of county assemblies who exercise delegated power from the people, mm. it, it must be a higher threshold because they are, they are undoing a, an a act sovereign. of the people, mm. a sovereign act. Mm. It should not be done easily. Uh, so if you come across circumstances where members of county assemblies say, you know, we are broke, and we want you, the governor, to give us a retreat so that we can get per DMs. Then the governor says, no, I have no money for a retreat. Then we are going to impeach you. <laughs> that, that clearly is never the intention of, um, of the okay. drafter of, of, of this law. And where those kind of things have happened, that clearly has been abuse. That, does that make this power unnecessary? No. The power remains innocent. The power is an important safeguard mm. in our constitutional architecture. Mm. So the power must remain. But I keep reminding Kenyans this, uh, uh, and I'll remind you in this studio and other Kenyans out there, that um, the law is not an answer to all our problems. No. Uh, the answer to a bulk of our problems just lies in good manners. <laughs> Let's just also get good mannered people in the correct spaces. Huh? Mm. Life will be more palatable. Well, that's interesting that you say that. Yes. Because members of the county assembly then would agree, would argue, mm. and not just in the case of mm. Meru, mm. but other parts where an impeachment motion then has been suggested or yes. preferred, mm. that these bad manners that yes. you speak of mm. then comes out in full glow, mm. public display, mm. and it is for that reason mm. that they feel it would then meet the threshold mm. then envisaged, envisaged by the Constitution. 
does that play a yes. role? Because if we're talking about the law, yes. and we're talking about just good behavior, yes, yes. good behavior, or that office demands a threshold for good behavior. Correct. And for them, they see, well, the, the behavior then that you exhibit mm. is not what that position has demanded over and over and over again. Correct. And then because of that, mm. we see no option but mm. to then suggest a motion for impeachment. That's exactly what the question anticipates. Mm. Question is, if you are ill-mannered mm. and your ill manners become egregious, mm. then they reach the level of gross violation of the constitution, gross mm. misconduct. So that's what the law anticipates, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but um, in these circumstances where people are using it as a bargain, it's actually those bargainers who are ill-mannered. <laughs> then they say, okay, uh, we are going to clothe our ill manners by an aura of constitutional argument mm. and say you have abused office Gross. or you have grossly violated the constitution and we are going to impeach you. Mm. Now, that is, that is abuse of power mm. on the part of those who are carrying out the, the impeachment. So I, I, I make an important argument here that the impeachment power is an important power mm -hmm. in our legal design. Mm -hmm. It's important. Members of county assemblies, the Senate must retain this power. Mm. We can rework the way it is exercised for efficiency mm. uh, purposes and so that it's not abused. But the, f the fact of this power, the essence of this power is not impeachable, it's not questionable. This the, is an important power. It's an important retain. power. The only thing we need to constantly be on the lookout for mm. is potential abuse of, uh, of, of, of this power. There's something those of us who teach question on law insist to our students, mm. that in a democracy, the, the law, what the law provides in its text mm. is just an architectural plan. Mm. An architectural plan is not a building. Mm -mm. However beautiful it looks, mm. it's actually useless in <laughs> itself. It's just yeah. a piece of paper. The real guarantee of the ambience that this architectural plan provides is something we call eternal vigilance. The people's consistent being on the lookout so that they guard against that abuse. That is the mm. guarantee. That is the, the, the real bond that the people have for good governance and good government. So, um, yes, uh, just to come back to your question, there have been instances when members of county assemblies have abused this power. Mm. Fortunately, because of the two-tier impeachment process, where the county assembly has to approve the motion mm. and then uh, the That's senate funny. has to relook at it mm. there has been power checking power which is what i told you earlier is it power. fortunate or unfortunate fortunate. because there are those that would argue that then also the senate has abused its power and privilege <laughs> yes by just completely disregarding any form of logical argument that's been brought before it yes. and just going by political decisions uh, certainly there have been or those other uh, inducements yes there yes there have been those uh, instances i mean i have i have reviewed in the mm. preparation for this case i reviewed the impeachment process for a gentleman called white you may like him or hate him mm. but i can assure you that uh, if you subject his impeachment to a rigorous scrutiny uh, there is more than miss the eye mm. um uh, you 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 look at it and uh you keep saying, you know, you know, I have some, I've invested quite a bit of years in studying this branch of learning. Mm. And therefore, when I subject to that test, it's not a casual uh, subjection I'm giving it. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you may, you may, you may dislike quite it for other reasons or other grounds out there. But I'm talking about the case that was presented to Senate. Yeah. Look at this case. Yeah. And say this case on this ground was approved. Then, then uh, they, you begin having question marks about the manner in which that power is abused. Anyone can abuse power. Mm. I began by pointing this out to you. The lessons I gathered from uh, Professor J. B. Ojuang, that this thing of saying no, no, let's remove power from this office is naive. Wherever you vest that power, that power can be abused there. And uh, even the ultimate office, mm. even when you say, you know, the manner in which Senate does this can be challenged in court, even that court can abuse power. Yeah. Then, of course, then there's an appellate process. The high court can abuse it. Then you appeal to the court of appeal. It can abuse it. But then there's the Supreme Court uh, that is final. Mm. Can it, they also abuse it? Yes, yes. they can abuse power. Mm. They can abuse power. There are scholars who have reviewed our Supreme Court and concluded that it has abused power multiple times. Mm. And it's just the nature of human power. Yeah. That's why I suggested to you people, there's no substitute for good manners. Good manners is the ultimate. Yes, the ultimate is finally here. Tab mama likuambia tabiambaya. Jana tabiambaya. That one is yes, we must also reflect on that for a while. Mm -hmm. I have argued that this country is in dire need of, of good, good manners. manners more than strict adhering the rule of law in and of itself. It's a conversation we'll be having in the next hour mm -hmm. with yes. the chairman of the Ethics and Anti Corruption Commission. Yes. Ethics yes. and values. Yes. Now,
there are some uh, governors and even legislators who have proposed an amendment to the way we approach impeachment. Mm. Some of them have said, let's safeguard a governor to come into office. Mm. First of all, learn the here to move forward of the office. I mean, and just get to understand this office. Mm. So don't impeach a governor before a certain time is over. And then also look, towards an election, why are you impeaching a governor? Mm. Now surely a deputy governor will come in and maybe they'll run this office for six months. So also, before an election, let's also have a safeguarded window this and that. Mm. Uh, what's your view on this? Uh, I mean, uh, law reform is a very strange thing. <coughs> Anyone who believes that the, the, the guarantee for better life is more law is naive. <laughs> I've told people that. Mm. What, do you, what do I do if I elect a governor today and we say you can't impeach him in the first six months? Then he goes to the marketplace with a firearm and begins shooting everybody. What do we do with him? Mm -hmm. Day two in office. Mm. Yeah. We, we will begin crying that we need a formula to remove this fellow from office. Mm. Day two yeah. in office. So that whereas a lawmaker sees one aspect of the problem once it is tested and sees it clearly, sometimes they forget that by looking at you as I'm looking at you, I have turned my, my, my eyes against the backside of my head. I'm not seeing another facet of the same problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when that other facet presents itself, you say, good gracious, we thought we knew the problem mm. was. We turned our eye against the worst part of, um, of, of that problem. My take is not that we immunize a governor who is one day office from impeachment or who is one month office from impeachment. Is that we use the impeachment hour correctly, mm. whether it's day one or on the last day. If we did that, all these fears uh, would go. If a member of the county assembly can misuse impeachment power when a governor is two months old in office, nothing stops him from misusing that power when a governor is two years old in office, assuming that you open up the window after two years. Mm. So the real recourse is dealing with this abuse of the power Rather than saying, no, no, if we insulate them for the first six months or the first one year, then, then so what? The abuse of that power will start once you open the gates after the lapse of that one year. And that is not very beneficial. I insist mm. there's no substitute for good manners. For good manners. We elect so, our governors, yeah. we elect our MCS, our MPs to exercise power correctly. Mm. More often than not. They honor that requirement in breach. So there's something you're not saying, <laughs> Alicia. So in these cases, the argument is not whether or not this individual did the thing that they have been accused of. Mm -hmm. That's not the argument. Mm -hmm. The argument here is whether these charges met the threshold yes. then yes. and whether this impeachment as a power then is being abused. Yes. It is not whether there is a case on whether the road was named after whom because yes. these are the things that were brought. Mm. It is not whether indeed money was lost or not. Mm. You're not arguing that because yes, yes. that could be a totally different thing if it actually did happen. Mm. What you're saying is that this is the measure. Yes. It has not reached here and it should not be yes. at this impeachment process. Mm. If those things did take place, yes. use other avenues to challenge mm. that. Mm. But this impeachment, mm. again, coming to the fact that it's being abused for what it can actually do. Mm. Because I think there's a confusion there mm. that we seem to say, well, if somebody, if it is alleged that somebody has done one, two, three, up until seven, yes. that was a number of counts. Yes. The fear is that, okay, <laughs> How are we ever going to get this person possibly charged and or punished yes. for this thing? Correct. We take it to impeachment and then there's Alicia Ongoya who's mm. saying, well, that's great, but you've not met the threshold. So everybody pack your bags and go. Mm. You see? Yes. The argument is both. Um, <laughs> in some circumstances, there are allegations that are just plainly false. I mean, you remember I made an argument in Senate that, you know, when you say I've named a road after Okondo, mm. Mm. Take me to Nairobi and say, he, a road is something physical. You know, a road is not in the mind. Mm -hmm. A road is not I abstract. See it, yeah. Yes. Take us to the road and tell us this road that starts from Standard Group mm. to Panari is now called Okonduro. Take us to that road. Mm. Mm. Don't tell us that somebody put some mischievous post on her Facebook post. Mm. I mean, that, that's elevating jokes to, mm. to new heights, mm. if you sort my opinion. Mm. A road is just a road. Mm. We can't engage Senate on what people talked about their spouses eh, on eh, their social media posts. People say mm. all sorts of things about their spouses on the social media posts. If you engage with those ones, uh, the world will come to a close. <laughs> uh, so that's number one. Then the second one is, uh, on the other occasions, is uh, uh, let's meet the threshold. For example, you, you take me through the accounts of this organization. Then you say, no, no, there's a voucher system, an mm. impress system here. The voucher must be signed by everybody. Mm. Oh, one of these vouchers is not signed by somebody. Well, there's a procedure of surcharge. 
you know, I can just charge you for this money and we clear this. Mm. In fact, the public finance management acts very clear mm. on uh, if you don't account for an interest, we just charge you mm-hmm. in the in the next month. Payback. So that unless there is complete pilferage that you can see a systemic pilferage, the fact that there is one impress unaccounted for. Mm-hmm. If you walk through government and you say for every department where there is an impress not accounted for, the thing will shut somebody down. must go home. <laughs> Everyone will go home. Let the them. nature of an accounting system is I've never come across an auditor who audits any department and does not find something that you can raise a question on. Yeah. So, that's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. That if we were to pick a simple impress and say, no, no, there's an impress here that uh, has not been accounted for. It's simple. Go and surcharge that person. Their next salary, next month's salary, clamp something out of it, refund it to government. But then it becomes gross and a serious issue if it is multiple cases. If it's multiple cases. Right. If it is multiple, then that is something. Or if there are persistent audit queries along that line. That The auditor came here this year, raised this question, came the following year, same question, same department, no action is being taken, then that may approximate or reach the level of gross misconduct. You it know, is back. Mm-hmm. You know, the, I'm listening to <laughs> what I'm referring to as this legal presentation, mm-hmm. and it's actually very interesting because now, at least on this matter of impeachment, we've actually addressed the law regarding impeachment. Mm-hmm. Not what somebody thinks, not what they would like, not even, and what they presented, yes, but through the lenses and through the microscope of what the law actually says about these things. But the thing that I like the most is the law in and of itself, without the practice and the vigilant observation of its practice, then it's exactly of no use to us. Correct. Because when we, we are not vigilant, it is then it's like we ourselves are colluding with the forces that are bent on ensuring that that law doesn't do what it's intended to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what that means then, Wakili, mm-hmm. that is next to impossible to impeach a governor. No, no, no. We have uh, impeached uh, Governor Waititu. We have impeached uh, Governor Sonko. Governor Wambora was impeached mm. uh, twice. Uh, twice. Only the court uh, saved him. Uh, he survived by... Um, Governor Wambora needs to be studied as a phenomenon. <laughs> he needs to be studied. Case study. <laughs> yeah, it's a case study. Uh, so it's possible. To, to impeach a governor, but uh, it, we should actually not find it pleasant that we impeach governors regularly. Because if we found it pleasant as a country, it will also put to question our own sense of judgment as electors. If, if, if after every election, the people we elect invariably are removed, eh, mm. then it means we are electing only gross violators of the constitution. Only people who grossly misconduct themselves. Mm. Should what does ourselves. that say about ourselves as it were? Yeah. So uh, it should not be something very pleasant that we invariably impeach government. Keep doing. Yes. Then I want to actually roll on to that mm. with the following question. Using the case of Governor Wambora mm. and now what is unfolding about Governor Kavera Mongaza, mm. should we say if a county assembly impeaches a governor after X number of times, go back to the people? dissolve this county assembly, county government mm. both the executive and the assembly take the matter back to the sovereign uh, well, our, our our law says that uh, when you elect a governor as an electorate remember that the person he or she has uh, appointed uh, nominated as a running mate is a potential governor so that must be an important part of what is weighing in your mind as you make that decision. Over and above his programs for roads, for schools, for healthcare, also as what is his potential success as really well. Because you are electing as a package. Yeah. And the law says that uh, if you remove that governor, then uh, his running mate takes over. There's a procedure for getting a new deputy governor when the person who was initially elected deputy governor assumes office. There's a procedure in law yeah. for that that is provided for. Hmm. So that's what we have today. Is it the best? Uh, it's debatable. No, my Whether we want to go back to the electorate, hmm. it's one of the choices we have. But let us not cry that we are spending so much money on elections because these things cut both ways. True. Uh, as citizens, we talk about waste uh, all the time. So let's not, one, if we choose that as an option, let's remember it as a cost consequence. When IEBC comes and says we need 11 billion to do this election this, in, this, uh, in, this in, this, in this county, let's remember those are the choices we make. And no choice is free of cost. Every choice has either a value or monetary mm. cost 
to to it mm. and um, um, I, I therefore make no value choice myself I say citizens just need to apply their mind and ask are they willing to take the logical value or monetary consequences of the choice nice that they make Wakili, thank you very much for joining mm. us. Isaac Babji says, is a moustache of wisdom in the studio this morning. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Elisha Ongoya is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya, a senior lecturer at the Kabarak University. He is a constitutional expert and he's been here giving us his own perspectives on impeachment laws, processes in this country. Come again soon, Wakili. Thank you. Keep it here for more conversations in the next hour. Good morning, 8 a.m. Spice up your life. Good morning. This is the news wire. I'm Lea Obaga. President William Ritter says that Kenya and France relations have grown steadily over the years, resulting in increased trade. Speaking after holding talks with France President Emmanuel Macron in Berlin, Germany, Ritter said that they'd signed an agreement that would see both countries grow their cooperation to other areas such as infrastructure, climate change, and regional peace efforts, especially in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Sudan. He further said that with other world leaders, they discussed how investment in renewable energy to transform Africa, the world, and create jobs for millions of youths. The World Health Organization has launched a new guideline on the prevention and management of wasting and nutritional edema as a part of its efforts to advance the global fight against acute malnutrition in children under five years. WHO Director General Tedros Sadamon says the Global Action Plan on Child Wasting recognized the need for updated normative guidance to support governments in the prevention and management of acute malnutrition. High Court advocate Elisha Ongoya says impeachment should be looked at as a power-to-power -power check that ensures a leader doesn't abuse his or her office. Speaking on Spice FM Situation Room, Ongoya, who was Meru Governor Kavira Mwangaza's lawyer during her impeachment process, however, said that MCAs have failed to use other checks and relied solemnly on impeachment. There are other methods that we can check the governor. One, you know very well that we go to court every day and challenge presidential actions. So we don't remove the president. You appoint somebody, we just go to court and quash that appointment. And uh, that's it. You remain in office, but your appointee has been removed. That's a method of checking you. Mm -hmm. Two, you know that the governor needs resources to run his or her government. You can just refuse to approve the budget if you discover that the manner in which the resources are being appropriated is not consistent with the aspirations of the county in question. Number three, you have things such as the Auditor General periodically comes and just audits the books of accounts of the county and by law the Auditor General must submit their reports of county audits to the county assembly and uh, the national parliament. So that's another way. You have the controller of budget. The mm -hmm. controller of budget must check the manner in which resources are removed from the county revenue fund. Before mm -hmm. you use the budget, this, re this withdrawal of money, this use of this money for paying salaries and so forth must be approved by the controller of budget. Leongoya says one of the reasons why Kawera wasn't impeached is because the MCAs failed to use the other ways of checking her before voting to impeach her. By the time you go to removing somebody from office, this person must be incorrigible. And this is the case we made before the Senate. That um, if I came to this studio and wanted to nitpick, I would find errors this morning from the things you have done here. I'll find that there are protocols laid down by this organization that if I were technical, I'll pick one or two that you have already breached. That's not a ground for removing you from office. There could be just internal memos that mm. can be circulated here to tell you how we can do things better. Or just peer meetings among yourselves to review each other after this meeting to say, no, no, we, we, tomorrow we are going to do things differently. By the time we come to terminating your services here, you must be incorrigible. Ongaya adds that out of 14 impeachments that have reached the Senate, only three have met the standard. Before Kawira, there had been 13 impeachment attempts at Senate. Out of those 13, three had been considered by the whole House and uh, 10 had been sent to the committees. All the 10 that were sent to the committee stage never saw the light of day they were disapproved. The three that had been considered by the whole House had been approved, which is why we were a bit apprehensive. You know, <laughs> those of you who are soccer fans, mm -hmm. statistics count. When uh, 
the Senate approved consideration by the whole House. Of course, that statistic was against the government because yep. of previous history. But uh, again, as a person in the position I occupied, is you marshal your team and tell them, you know what, we have a role to play. Our role is to make the best case possible out mm-hmm. of the situation. Then the decision maker is somebody else. Never give up. A family in Baringo Valley in Akuru County is in distress following the disappearance of their grade six son. The boy's parents, James Gikonyo and Susan Wangoi, said the boy was in the company of his sisters who were cutting grass before he disappeared. The minor is reported to have vowed that he'll run away and never return home. He later went to collect milk jerrycans meters away but did not return. The family waited for him but in vain. Police have launched investigations in finding out where the boy might have gone. And in the international Sin Hamas leader Ismail Haniya said that his militant movement was nearing a truce agreement with Israel. Negotiators have been working to seal a deal to allow the release of around 240 mostly Israeli hostages seized on October 7th during the deadliest assault of Israel in its history. That's the Newswire. I'm Leah Obaga. Spice FM, Kisumu. It's a busy morning and the rain keeps coming down. The drizzle, uh, heavier in some parts than others. Let's look at what's going on. Coming off Waiaki Way, very heavy traffic as you get out towards Westlands. And coming in from Lower Kabete, as you go through towards Spring Valley. Remember, General Mothenge is not a pretty picture right now. There's a lot of flooding there, so you want to be careful. Uh, also, you're going to see pools of water in many places. Please be careful as you approach because we're not quite sure the depth of them. Are you coming off the Thicker Superhighway? There's traffic on Outer Ring. It's coming in and touching on the Thicker Superhighway, so it's tailed back quite some. And then you're going to join the highway. Quite a lot of traffic there. The service lanes will help at some point, so you want to think about using them. Uh, Kiambu Road, again, getting further and further away from Muthaiga Square with traffic, many, many lanes to deal with this morning. And uh, on Limuru Road, that is also giving and it's giving heavy. Are you coming off Mombasa Road going towards the Nyaya Stadium roundabout? Heavy traffic. The Eastern Bypass, heavier still. You're touching on Mbakasi at the junction going towards Outer Ring. Everywhere you look this morning, there's a spot of traffic. Want to watch out for this. Let us know what's going on where you are. We're trying to keep things moving. Help us out. Let's talk Spice FM. KE on X. This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom, Wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, Pan Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is the Situation Room. The only it way to start your day. After eight, we are on to the third hour of the situation room this morning. Thank you very much to everybody who's locked in on YouTube, on Facebook, on Spice FM across the country, on KTN Home across the globe. Asante Sana, we're here until 10 a.m. Every week, the morning, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. It's a situation room on Spice FM. This next hour, we want to talk about ethics and our value system of the country. And we are therefore joined by the chairperson of the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. Before we welcome him to the show, let's remind you about the value of paying school fees on time. Indeed, Mm. and paying them at all. Mm. Many times you're going to ask yourself the question, are we going to be able to do that come January? Well, okay, so maybe it might get a bit iffy. And Kiwi says, all right, let's help you out in that, okay? Step up and shine has been the mantra of Kiwi for a very long time. So even when things are getting just a little bit difficult, walk into a supermarket today and purchase a tin of Kiwi. It's the new design that you're looking for. And once you purchase that, you're going to follow the instructions on the yellow starburst here. Star 459, star 5 hash. And there's a code when you pop the lid that you will then want to insert. 
you win airtime, you win data, then you also get a chance to enter into a draw where four people every week are winning 35,000 shillings. It goes towards school fees. So you don't have to worry about that just because you bought a tin of kiwi. Do it today. Step up and shine with kiwi. All right. Bishop Dr. David Oginde is the chairperson of the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. Okay. Bishop Emeritus, Dr. David Oginde. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Kenya's biggest conversation again. Thank you. It's good to have you here once again. Thank you very much. We're going to have a conversation about ethics. Our previous guest, Advocate Elisha Ngoya, kept telling us and reminding us once, twice, I think number of like six times, when we're talking about impeachment and how we get good leaders, he said, you know what, eh? in all these cases, there's no substitution for good manners. Mm -hmm. I think that will segue right into the conversation we'll have. <laughs> but we welcome you to the show. City has the day's proverb, and this week's proverbs are from Namibia. The Republic of Namibia. It's the Republic of Namibia. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. A little rain each day will fill the rivers to overflowing. A little rain each day will fill the river to overflowing. Bona Chairman, what's yes. your interpretation of this proverb? Kidogo, kidogo, hujaza kibaba. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what the Swahili would say. That's mm -hmm. a good translation. What's the interpretation <laughs> of the problem? <laughs> <laughs> that uh, little things that sometimes may look very insignificant can make a very big difference in the long run if left to, you know, accumulate. Mm. Mm. So it's a both a positive and a negative uh, proverb in my view. Uh, you know, uh, Swahili again, Usipo Ziba Ufa, Tajenga Ukuta. You know, if you don't deal with a crack, uh, you may end up building the wall. Again, because sometimes these small things are ignored and they can grow up to be big issues. So on the negative side is that anything small that is uh, negative and left on its own can become a big problem that eventually you may not even be able to, to tackle. Mm. But on the positive is that uh, the little coins we sometimes ignore and uh, throw or leave at the till, you know, mm. uh, if you keep them little by little, you may soon find you have millions. Mm. Uh, so on the positive side, don't ignore the little that you have. Mm. It could add up to something big. That's how it I understand from mm. that proverb. Uh, it's a very good understanding. <laughs> it's a very good understanding. When you say it's, uh, it's both negative and positive, it's absolutely true. Because even if you look at what we may say ails this country, it didn't start as some big event. No. It's little things, a little here, a little here, and it just kept building. Yeah. A little change here, a little accommodation here, a little understanding here. A little looking the other way here, mm -hmm. and then you look up, and then you have this monster staring at you. Yep. Yes. But it didn't start as a monster. Mm -hmm. No. Mm. It grew as we watched. Yes, we did. Mm. And we kept calling it something else, and yet mm -hmm. it was showing us exactly what it was all along. Right. But we refused to acknowledge that. What it was showing us is what it actually is. Yeah. Until you have no option but to admit that actually this is it. Mm. Mm. True. You kind of admitted something like that the other day when you said, and it's not fast growing, but has turned into, that Kenya has now turned into a valueless society. It's on the path to becoming a valueless society. So we're dealing with a little bit more than a crack. Yeah. Uh, the wall is uh, about to come down from what you were saying. Yes. What points you to say something like that? What are you seeing um, that we say, okay, yeah. yes, we can say this is the reason. Um, I was I was saying that in the context uh, as a, a graduation ceremony speaker mm -hmm. and looking at the education sector in a season when we are um, we were just going through the just completed the two primary school exams and then now into the uh, secondary school exam and the education sector is an area where we have seen this little little uh, negative. Uh, things happening that have now become huge. Mm -hmm. uh, cheating in exams is almost expected. That's why we mobilize 
uh, for primary school exams and secondary school exams, we almost mobilize the whole army of the country mm -hmm. uh, to supervise that. I don't know about you, but myself, when we were doing uh, CPE at the time exams, there was no single presence of any police officer anywhere. Mm. They, are, they were very just one or two invigilators. Yep. Our head teacher, headmaster, went to the uh, local division headquarters, picked the exams the previous day, tied on his bicycle, and uh, rode back. And the following day, we were doing exams. Mm. There was no thought that this can be stolen or somebody may open it before time and mm. so on. And it was just normal. Now we have come to the place where even with the seals and the containers and so on, uh, we still have to have security officers. You have to mobilize the whole government to mm. be involved in, in, in this uh, uh, exam supervision. And you ask yourself, where did little children in primary school learn about stealing exams. Little children in primary school. It is not them. It is their parents who buy these exams. It is their teachers who sell these exams. It is some unscrupulous people who do that. And it has become almost normal for mm. that to happen so that if there is no protection, as it were, mm. the exam would actually be flooded uh, all around the country for mm. people to see. And you take that all the way. I teach at a university. And you find that even at that level, there are students who do not want to do the work. They just want to get the degree. Mm. Uh, and it goes beyond that. There are people who have never seen the inside of a university, but have degree certificates that they want to present to get uh, jobs. And we have seen that at the lowest levels and the highest levels. We are sitting in the Anti-Corruption Commission. One of the uh, things we deal with is cases of people who have got jobs using fake certificates. Mm. And it is not two, three, four. It's in the hundreds mm. uh, cases that come to us. And uh, you wonder why would anybody want to get a job for which they are not qualified? So when you look at all that, then this is just one sector of education. You realize that we have lost any sense of integrity. Uh, we have to have a body like the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission to help us do the right thing. That tells you that there's a problem. If you go into a house where you find parents shouting at children, sit down, do this, go, don't go there, don't touch that, you know. They have locked the fridge, they have, mm. you know. You know there's something <laughs> wrong in this house, <laughs> you know. That is not normal. Mm. So that is where I see our country we are at. And if we don't do something, we are going to degenerate into our situation. It's so that, that is where uh, I was coming from. That's where from. you're coming mm. from. Yes. Why did the rain start beating us? Somebody I'm sure you've had time to reflect yeah. and ask yourself, I mean, you've gone back into your own days, sitting the primary exam to date. Where do you think the rain started beating us? Uh, I, somebody asked me that question and I, I began to reflect and wonder what, what actually happened. And uh, I could trace it back into the late 80s, uh, into the 90s, when we began to have mega corruption in this country and uh, things were happening and it's like they are overlooked. And so it began to become normal. That is when you talk about corruption. I'm afraid to say uh, the Matatu set for us a culture. So we actually have become a Matatu culture nation. Mm -hmm. Where when I first came to Nairobi, buses used to stop only at bus stops. Uh, Kenya buses, I mean. Uh, 
you, when a, an older person enters the bus, you, if you are a younger person, you stood and gave them the seat. And, and things like that. You, you went to the toilets in the public spaces. Uh, there, were, there were all these signs showing, show toilet, you know. And you'd go and look for them and go to the toilet. Then come this culture of matatus can stop anywhere. They can pick passengers anywhere. They, uh, they can overtake you. They can go in front of you and so on. And initially, the, the ordinary person uh, driving their Pub, private car mm. would be very irritated but stay on the lane then with time we realize that if you stay on the lane you will not get there <laughs> at least not in good <laughs> time <laughs> so we followed and that has gone into almost every sector you go to a banking hall people don't want to queue you go to pay your electricity bill you don't want to queue you want to find out who can uh, help you go around this quickly. So the culture of shortcuts has come upon us uh, a bit slowly, just like the proverb said, but now it's becoming uh, an El Nino upon us that is now wiping us out. So this culture of shortcuts, get things quickly, uh, get rich quickly, impatience on the road, impatience in, in every place where we are, is now what is driving us, and uh, it's, it's become a culture. In fact, when you do good, mm. is you are the one who is on the wrong, you know. I've he been hit many times talking about road uh, because I stopped at the red lights, and somebody expected that I should be going. So when I braked and stopped to wait for the red light, they were shocked. <laughs> Rampy. They ram into you. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's it's a culture that is uh, eating our nation. I must say. So is it economy, capitalism? I don't think so. There are many cap. Uh, I, I mean, I don't. We are not the only capitalist country in the world. There are many good capitalist countries. In fact, they are very disciplined. You know, because economy thrives in order, in a place where there is order. Where we are going, if we don't do anything about it, and I'm talking about all of us as a nation, is this is not going to be one person. It is going to be something that we decide as a nation. Mm -hmm. If we don't organize, organize ourselves, we are going to lose the place that we have. Because nobody wants to come and do business in a chaotic environment where there are no rules and where there is no order. Uh, people want to do business where things are certain. You know, if we agree with you that you're going to deliver, you deliver. Uh, if I promise that I'm going to do this, I do it. Uh, if if uh, I get a government uh, certificate, I know it is real. If I have a title deed, I know it, it is real. But if you're in an environment where I cannot be sure that the title deed you're giving me mm -hmm. is real, the certificate you're giving me is true, then it becomes very difficult to do business. It becomes very difficult. So uh, that's why we have to do something. But it is nothing to do with capitalism. It has to do with bad manners. It is lack of values, mm. lack of integrity. There's always the adage. I mean, I don't, it's become an adage or it's become a thing that now we say to explain it away that you cannot legislate for morality. You cannot legislate uh, against bad manners. Um, the long arm of the law, because then bad manners are manifested in certain things, certain activities. We see now the pilfering, we see now the cheating, all of that manifestation of those bad manners. Um, but then along the line, the thing is, it's a mind over matter issue. How are we getting to the point whereby we are now able to turn the hands of time? We're able to turn the the, the, the needle on that kind of behavior. And I think that's the question that grapples a lot of, a lot. how do you change that? Un until and unless it is a, an individual mindset change then that occurs, you're unlikely to see the mushrooming of that kind of behavior. How do you insist that that kind of thing now occurs in the minds of every individual? Mm -hmm. It's tough. Uh, if you followed my the vetting uh, before I got into this space where I am today, mm. I did actually propose that uh, 
fighting corruption and uh, the bad manners that we have in this country is not going to be done through legislation is not going to be achieved through an agency like country corruption commission it is going to be a whole nation approach where we we have kenyans who believe that we cannot continue this way in every sector whether it is in school whether it is in uh, in a government office a mm -hmm. private sector mm -hmm. on the roads everywhere and uh, we almost start like a movement of integrity of doing things right that i'll just not do the wrong thing i will not pay a bribe to get a, 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 a service that i deserve i'm not going to overlap on the road i'm not going to cheat in exams and mm -hmm. all those kinds of thing and uh, it is that which can transform and begin to change the culture uh, and if we see this at different levels all the way from the lowest person to the highest person and it is not just talk it is actually doing that is what changes uh, culture mm. and then the more critical thing is that our children need to be helped from the lowest level at the young age because some of these things you can only catch them at the young age so by teaching by training but by role modeling mm. we can actually change uh, and transform this nation into uh, a cultured society there are nations that are doing that i mean there's a, a clip that was going around about the japanese mm. children mm. and how they 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 cross the roads and thank the the traffic uh, the the vehicles that have given them way to pass and so on it is something that is inculcated while you're young if again if i go back to my childhood uh, when we were in school we were taught that you respect anybody who is older than you yep. it doesn't matter whether it is your brother or your sister or your parents or your or teacher a stranger. and or a stranger you know you just respected them mm -hmm. you if they tell you something you you obey uh and that's how we grew up that's what we knew and it was kind of almost ingrained in your system that uh, you don't re uh, you don't uh, talk back to an older person mm -hmm. uh, you you don't answer rudely yeah but these days I, you find little children telling you off <laughs> in a, in a very strange manner and you wonder wow where did this one come from yeah. so it's it's a it's a whole society um move uh, let me call it movement that may have to be started by those of us who are adults and who believe in uh, in restoring our values so right. we are looking for value champions in every sector i actually think you will not succeed uh, chairman you think I will not succeed? No, no, the movement will not succeed. No, it will. It has succeeded in other places. It will not succeed. Oh, so tell me why. You see, the, <laughs> the places you say they have succeeded is what I will ask. Where exactly? Tell me where it has succeeded, why it has succeeded. Maybe after we take the break, Eric? No, he can Good. tell us now. He has given us. us an example of Japan. Yes. Right? Yes. Mm. You see... Everything the chairman said, the bishop said, is actually true. Except. No, there's no except. <laughs> it isn't an except. Mm. <laughs> there, it's an amalgam of very many things that more or less come together and coalesce and they bring about a certain result. If you look at the time you were in primary school, around the same time I was in primary school, are we saying that the teachers were respected more in our time than they are respected now? And if so, why is it that when we were in primary school and even secondary, what the teacher said, well, you abided by perhaps even more than what your parents told you? Mm -hmm. In the communities that we came from then, why were teachers respected as much as they were? Because even the parents respected the teachers. Very much. I mean, they were the most respected people in society. Yes. The question is, why and they were, it's a past tense, yes. then what happened? See, this group of people whom 
you give the power to look and bring up your children because that's what teachers actually do mm -hmm. for all these years what do you think happens when the position they held and which enabled them to transmit those values we speak of which would augment the values that the parents had when that position is devalued then what do you think is going to happen in that society because everybody goes to school at some point even yes. if they drop off yes so the value system and the place where it the support system was nestled was disrupted completely mm -hmm. Now, what we see, in my opinion, is an outcome. Now, the other outlaying support system that helped erode it were things like the Ndegwa Commission, the interpretation of it. The and land grabbing by the independence. Exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, precisely. Because in that earlier time, it was understood that when you did wrong, you'd be called out and you understood it was wrong. And people were afraid. People went out of their way to hide what they did, which was mm -hmm. wrong. Mm-hmm. We are in a time when nobody hides anything. No. They more or less dare you to say anything. So I am saying... So City, you haven't told the bishop why he won't succeed. He won't succeed mm. because when you talk about setting up a group of people who will bring about change and you haven't clearly identified what the problem is and what the solution is because you've pointed there's a problem here, there's a problem here, there's a problem here. You see... You are counting on having like-minded people who will pursue the agenda together with you. What is your guarantee that these people are of a similar mindset as you? What is your guarantee that they are not using this as a vehicle to serve their own interests? When you have a perverted society like ours, what are these guarantees? Um, let's take a break. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hard it over. We'll come back. It's half past eight. Kenya's biggest conversation is hosting Bishop Emeritus Dr. David Oginde. He's the chairperson of the Ethics and Anti Corruption Commission. We are talking about reinstituting an ethics and value based society in this country. Is it possible? Is it not? He has a tough job. We pay him for it. We expect him to deliver. <laughs> City is saying. <laughs> <laughs> This is The Situation Room, the only way to start your day. The man who looks at a beautiful girl and doesn't talk to her will end up serving lunch at her wedding. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> City, mm. do like that. My father has killed a mouse. Will he fail to kill a man? I'm a wapanya. Small mammal, big mammal. Mtu wa tamshinda. I mean, I don't answer. What, what well, are they how saying? How are we comparison? I mean, he a mouse. What are they saying? What they're saying is, uh, my father has <laughs> killed a mouse. <laughs> Will he fail to kill a man? <laughs> <laughs> name, surprise. Someone's name. So, the name they, surprised they, you? No, the name is surprise. <laughs> No, what am I saying? I'm from Nigeria, man. I met somebody <laughs> called I Believe. So See? Like, ah, your name is I Believe? Yes, my name is I Believe. But that's the short form. I said, excuse me? I said, yes. My no name problem. is I Believe. So what's no, the fooling? No, I believe in the goodness of the <laughs> <laughs> The Situation Room. Kenya's biggest conversation. Cloudy conditions and rain still continuing in Nairobi at 16, highs of 21 and lows of 15. And we'll see highs of 21 in a mostly cloudy Nakuru at 18. It's 17 and cloudy in Nyeri with highs of 21. And we're looking into a mostly cloudy with rain in Mombasa with 26 and highs of 31. Malindi will see highs of 31 and the rain continues as well. It's cloudy at 22 in Kisumu with highs of 27 and cloudy at 19 in a mostly cloudy Kakamega are going to highs of 25. We're looking into a heavy... Um heavy morning of rain in Kampala at 19 with highs of 27 and rain showers have started in Dar es Salaam going to highs of 31 today and lows of 25 into a sunny Mogadishu at 28 and a sunny Addis Ababa at 16. Johannesburg is partly sunny now at 20 and uh, going to highs of 33 it's mostly clear at 25 in Lagos. Light rain showers continue in Kinshasa at 24 going to highs of 30. up your life. 
All roads lead to the city centre this morning and it's heavy coming off Manyanja Road, touching on Jogo Road this morning, coming in then as well on the Thika Super Highway and Kambu Road uh, is quite a mess still till now. So this network and web of traffic coming in from all parts, Limuru Road, and then going west towards Lai, um, Lower Kabete and then Gong Road coming through to the Southern Bypass. And then we're also, mm, actually, Southern Bypass, quite some traffic there as you get past that Langata Junction. Not quite sure what's cooking there, but uh, how about you give us a shout out just in case you're in the area. And we're looking at Magadi Road, then spilling over to Langata Road at this point. Eastern Bypass coming in towards the Outer Ring Junction. It's also a bit messy with traffic. Keeping an eye on all of this, help us out here as well. Folks, let us know what's going on where you are. Want to try keep things moving. Yes, it's still raining, so things slow down a bit. So be careful as well. Let's talk on Spice FM KE on X. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice FM, Nairobi. News with the Bishop Emeritus Dr. David Oginde, Chairman, Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. He's told us, well, yes, we have a problem in the, as a country in terms of values and ethics as a people, and we need to start doing something to re-engineer our society. To re-engineer our society, the bishop says, we have to have champions and value champions in the society, recruiting them and using them to spread this gospel. City says, I don't believe this can work. Because what guarantees would you have of even those people that you're bringing on board actually playing along? He's asking a person who has preached for many years, what guarantees he has of converting people into the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that is Surely. precisely what I'm doing. You see, the, the faith to which I also subscribe mm. invites us to do precisely that. It's come, let us reason together. That is exactly <laughs> what I'm doing. Mm. Because we know the state our country is in. And if the efforts were being made with the vigor that is required, yeah. The cracks that we see, we would be seeing, but there'd also be mention of cracks that have been filled, which no longer exist. Okay? Because the membership in our churches doesn't decrease in this country. It increases. And I feel, and I think, and I also know that part of the reason that we haven't fallen apart completely at the seams is because one day is a God and people pray and God does hear and he does answer. Not that we have such wonderful leaders who lead us in the right path. That is not the reason. For whatever reason, God has decided to hold this country together. Whatever reason. That's something that only God knows. But as for the people, because now coming back to the people, because the bishop is talking about the people. <laughs> nice. And you're asking how he'd be able to actually go to the people and tell no, the people, that let's he, change, that, that let's he will do. walk this. That he has even started. Mm. I am sure he's not alone in this movement. There are people like PLO who are also talking about these things at mm. the Pan-African level or whatever. There are people who understand and can see that there's something that has to be done and they are doing things. Now, when I say I don't see them succeeding, it's for the simple reason that I understand human nature. Where we are at, we are because people want to be here. If they didn't, then we would not be where we are. How do you stop them liking where we are and being in the position that we are in? Do you agree, Bishop, that we are comfortable uh, and happy? Hap that we are comfortable and happy? Mm. I don't believe so. Talk to any ordinary Kenyan. One of the things that is in the lips of every, almost every Kenyan is corruption. So many Kenyans are involved in unethical conduct and behavior not because they like it but because it's the only way of survival, or the, so they think. Uh, you asked me, where has this been done? I don't have to go out there. Right here in this country, I'm sure you were around in 2003. I've been around since 1958. I've been around just slightly after you. <laughs> <laughs> so we have been around together. Yes. 2003, mm. when the NAC government came into power, mm. 
I think things were worse than where we are today, perhaps. No. The where we are is by far the worst we've ever been. Okay. Yes. Uh, whichever, but whatever it, the but case, it was, but it was, it was bad. Yes, it was. It mm. was bad. Now, because there were people who believed that a country can be changed, and they began to do certain things that would put us back on track. Talk about, I used the Matatu culture. When Honorable Michuki came in and tried to uh, say he's going to tame the um, Matatu culture and said you're going to sit in a Matatu with a seat belt on, people laughed. We laughed, you know, because previously the government had tried all means, including uh, introducing Nyayobas to try and tame this, <laughs> this, this, uh, this sector, and it never worked. All the efforts that have been put in had never worked. But when a very systematic way and the, the championing of it happened, the same Kenyans who you are saying are comfortable said, if you are going to tame the Matatus, we are willing to work for the period that you are doing this. And they worked. Why? Because they were looking towards a better future where uh, they would be in this matter to putting on seat belts, sitting mm. comfortably, and so on. So they were willing. They said, okay, we will walk. And they walked. So then I and that helped mm. to, to bring us back. Let me just still be in the same. Mm. That same time, the grabbing of land that was in this country mm. was unbelievable. When Raila Odinga came in as minister for roads and uh, said we need we want to build bypasses around the city and all the bypasses were full of very high class uh, houses. houses we all laughed to say I mean you can't bring down that house and they were brought down and they were brought down suddenly people realized that something is happening here and let's be part of it and so even ordinary Kenyans who are arresting police officers. And this was happening across the board. And the culture of the nation uh, really was beginning to transform and change uh, because there was light at the end of the tunnel, something that people had been yearning for and hoping for, but seemed like it is now coming and we want to be part of this. And so that put us on a trajectory that was, uh, we were listed in the world as the, the most joyful and happiest people in the world. Optimistic. Optimistic, Optimistic. you know, uh, in the world. Unfortunately, our politics ruined that opportunity. That moment definitely was lost. It was lost. But it is trying to, in answering you, telling you that we got a glimpse that Kenyans are not comfortable with where they are. Mm. So even in that position of uncomfortability, yes. are we saying then that people need a morality marshal? You need somebody Those are the who people is I was calling going champions. to yeah, somebody who is going to stand up and say folks, this is the way it ought to be and because of that standing up and expressing this that it will awaken that stirring that already is resident in the hearts and minds of Kenyans. Exactly. We just need somebody to come and say, okay, guys, bring it out. The same way you give the example. People were very uncomfortable with the Matatu situation, did not like the recklessness, did not like the bad manners and the bad behavior, but they needed somebody to come out and say, this is how we are going to operate moving forward and people will now coalesce mm -hmm. around that idea. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is that people have a desire to want to behave well. Exactly. People have a desire to want to do the right thing. Right. But we need somebody who is always, you know, holding that flag and saying, guys, wake up tomorrow morning, let's remember that this is the way we ought to go. The question is, well, who this is this person? <laughs> that person <laughs> Whom is shall you. I send? <laughs> <laughs> who will go for us? Yeah. Let me give you a, a, another example. Mm. These persons, if you notice that we are mentioning names, not institutions. Mm. We are talking about people, not institutions. Uh, people who champion the right thing. And this is what I'm saying. If we have these champions in every sector, including you here in the media industry, mm. because we know the things that also happen in your own sector here. <laughs> Okay, so 
if you you are that champion in this in the media industry and mm -hmm. say we are not going to allow this in our media industry we as uh, media people journalists this is how we are going to conduct ourselves mm -hmm. you look at schools there are schools in this country that are known for championing the right kind of values mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. and every parent wants their children in those schools because they have strict discipline they have values the people who come out of that place you can see them they stand out uh, in society and so why are parents fighting to get their children there because they want those things so that uh, i'm still answering the question that kenyans are happy with where we are we are not mm. Mm. we are where we are we are trying to survive in that environment but it is a very expensive environment to live in where if you have to get your child to school you have to pay somebody or pay something if you have to get a service you have to do something you have everything you have to pay for outside of the normal channels in order for you sometimes even on the street you want a parking you have to pay someone <laughs> to to give you a parking yeah you know that is how bad it is. Hmm. Who is happy with that? Nobody. We are not happy, Bishop. And so, I agree. Yes. That is why we created, when we were writing our constitution in peacetime, yes. we actually sat and had a conversation, a national conversation, and we said corruption, pain point. Yes. But when we went further than that, and we said, actually, the issue is deeper, and it's about our value system. And we wrote a whole chapter called Chapter 6. Mm -hmm. And then we said we shall have institutions that are, shall help us in this. And ESCC was created. Right. Even beyond that, there's one called the National Anti-Corruption Campaign Steering Committee. That uh, was to go to the population and, you know, start injecting this whole conversation that mm. we have. But all this has been talk. Talk for many years. Your predecessor, another prelate as yourself, has said the same thing. Those who have headed the National Anti-Corruption Campaign Steering Committee have said the same thing. We talk, Bishop. We don't do it. We talk. And we it's like we're it. just comfortable talking, releasing reports, talking, releasing reports. Even now as I'm hearing you, I'm not hearing a start date and people in place. And you've been in office for many months now. And as a chairman of the ESCC, I am not hearing a solution that we're preferring that you're saying, this is what we shall do beginning 12th of December. Thank on you. On the or occasion of our Jamhuri. I'm not hearing that. It's more talk. No, I'm, I'm, I was answering your questions. Okay. <laughs> I was answering your question. So, uh, so far you have not asked me, uh, what are we doing? You have asked me oh, the state of the nation. So we were really analyzing the state of the nation, mm. uh, which, which I think we, 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 we have done. And, and uh, all of us agreed that we are in, in a bad place. And uh, the only difference is that uh, where we were not agreeing with him is that he thinks that we cannot get out of it. Mm. I think that we can. And, and, and that's why I am where I am and that's where I sit where I sit now. Okay. Because of that belief. If I so believe, what roadmap have you drawn, Mr. Chairman, to uh, get us out of this place where we are at? One of the things that we are doing as a commission uh, in the area of values is exactly what I've said. We are going into institutions. We are going into uh, schools. We are going into uh, various organizations and trying to raise and identify the champions that we are talking about so that these people can champion value-based living especially among our younger folk now at a, at a, since we said that you really need a, a two-pronged approach one is education and education helps people to appreciate the value of values because like i said there are people who are involved in this because they think this is only way things can be done. Mm. But they need to be helped to realize that there is a better way of doing things.
So that comes through education, and we are doing that education process, uh, partnering with various institutions and so on. But at another level, there is the modeling. The modeling, you have to have people who can be role models in doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And that's where we want these champions and models. Then thirdly, actually, it, which is part of the modeling, but also uh, showing from a negative perspective, mm. the sanctions on people who do not toe the line. Example that we gave up, uh, about the roads, for example, uh, is those people who are on the roads had their buildings brought down. Mm. And so people realize that you can't go in that direction. Uh, some people are even demolishing their own uh, their own buildings yeah. before you came. So th the sanctions is an area that we really also are working on. Mm -hmm. We cannot allow leaders to just act in bad manners. And you have seen, uh, maybe you have seen or heard uh, us calling people to, uh, to account on their actions which are not in line with uh, with what you expect of an ethical society. Mm. So that is going to be heightened so that we actually call out people. There's a practice that we have done, uh, uh, we have held in the commission that, that we now have to change mm. because we, we used to, we have been talking about people almost protecting their image and so on. But you are saying, no, if you are not shameful to do what you are doing, why should we protect you? So sometimes we say we have arrested uh, six people uh, or we have caught uh, a senior officer, yeah. you know, but we don't give the names. This is to protect the individual uh, from that. But we are finding that while you are protecting the image of this person, they go back and do exactly the same thing. Yeah. So you're we, enabling them. We, <laughs> exactly. So we are moving from that and we are now going to say uh, so and so did this and this is what we have done about them. So three pronged approach. Yes. Education, modeling and of course calling to account the sanctions. Exactly. Right? I see like it looks like a graduation start at the very basic with education and modeling. Yes. And then those that fail to be grabbed by that net and they get into the board system you nab them exactly okay so when do you but it is when, all when going together this? it's not like we are going to start here it's happening and, together. Uh, it is all happening together yes when when do we st why, the sanction has already started there's a, there are laws in place and all yes. those things and we see ESCC and raids all the time modeling and education education is already going on hmm. how we have uh, what we call um, uh, ethics clubs integrity clubs within schools uh, which we want to change into uh, integrity champions uh, within schools so that the idea of a club is like you are the integrity people uh, as we can do our thing. Yeah. <laughs> so mm. it's not a club of in, uh, people of integrity and then the rest of the school is. So we want these people who enlist, these children who enlist into this club or are enlisted into these uh, uh, groups to champion integrity, to uh, we have teachers who will uh, train in matters ethics and right conduct and behavior within schools. That is already ongoing. And, and in some of the schools where we have done this has been very, very successful. For example? What do you mean, for example? A school, one of the schools. Case study. Uh, but right, right here in Nairobi, we can talk about the, uh, the Muslim girls. Uh, right in Pangani. Mm. Uh, we actually, it's almost all the schools. Uh, I, I don't know so that. So these clubs think. exist in all the schools? Most of the schools. And so. this is the public school system? It is not just public. Well, across it is both. across the board. Mm. It is public and private, all of them. Mm. Because they are, no, they are no public and private children. Mm. Yes. They, are all, yeah. uh, they are all our children and in different schools. So we have a whole education department mm. in, in ESCC that champions this. Mm. So we work with teachers, we work with uh, schools in different, uh, in different places, and uh, we help them in that area. The other thing that is there that uh, we would like to see come up even better 
is that there's an integration already that has happened in the curriculum of education mm -hmm. uh, that is supposed to entrench values. But you see, things that are not examined are not taken too seriously. Mm -hmm. So we want to see how that can actually be taken more seriously, uh, whether we can actually move to the place where this as part of the examinable uh, uh, subjects or issues within within the within the school system because that then will give them the seriousness and perhaps teachers and students will take this more seriously but I, I can say that the whole thing about education on ethics and integrity is already ongoing in schools perhaps we have not given this the highlight at national level for people to know that this is happening mm. but it is not something that started yesterday it is something that has been uh, been ongoing uh, but we are enhancing how do you measure success how do you know for example in muslim girls we started this program this uh, in this year and this is now how we are seeing we are graduating people who are more morally upright and more ethical into our society we have stories we, we have stories from the schools, from the children, from the teachers uh, of the changes that they have seen in their children, specific children or a uh, group of children uh, that have embraced this. So that, like, for example, when uh, during the uh, Africa Integrity Day, Anti-Corruption Day, we had some of these showcasing of, of children that came forward and they gave their stories of some of the things that they do and some of the things that have happened to the transformation that has happened in their lives, how they stand up against uh, evils and ills in their, in their schools. And so that tells you that there's a change that is taking place. Mm. Uh, there's, but you, you but it, sounds like it, no, it sounds like, you know, it's, it's a soft one. You gave an example of a radical one, Mishuki radical. He said, stop. From tomorrow, seat belts in all matatus, yellow line on all matatus. <laughs> yes. It wasn't at you, we are going to champion no. those matatus that are doing well, those ones that are not no, playing this loud is, music. We are talking well about education. Yeah. In education, I mean, how do you become radical in education? We but have just you done actually, radical thing and uh, changed the entire education you system. Do. Hmm. You do. When, of what use is the English language that is taught in schools and Kiswahili and maths and everything else, if the person who is being taught is completely left rudderless. Should this not be an integral and integral and an examinable an examinable, examinable. Mm. aspect <laughs> of the curriculum? Because that is true. You see, and that's you know, what I talked about. It has to be. You know, this it, 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 it can't be something that we take baby steps in. The Holocaust is a subject that is taught in Germany. It is taught. From the time somebody can understand, it's taught and it's graduated. You know why? They don't ever want people to forget it. Good point. Corruption is killing us. Right. We have to teach these things so that people know. Instead of the government coming and telling us, if you don't have Maisha Telecard, you cannot get <laughs> government <laughs> services. That, that is radical. Yes. It's nonsensical. It's making you get the card <laughs> and use your eyes. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> because this is the thing. That that, when you're that's, dealing that with is a, true. When you're dealing with, a, as I always liken it to when uh, a cancer patient and the doctor is... Uh, their oncologist is there. It's not okay. How about we have a conversation with this cancer and see if we can convince it to go away? No. We cut the thing out and then we blast it with radiotherapy <laughs> or chemotherapy. Yes. That, that's, it's got to be if we want it to go. That's and how you want serious, this person to live. And you want this person to live. Corruption is killing us. Bad manners is killing us everywhere. Everywhere. So in order to deal with this thing that is killing us, it's not spoiling us. It's killing us. We have to be just as radical as the thing itself very is. Very true. Very true. I, I don't see another way. I agree. Mm. I, I agree totally. Mm. I agree totally. And and um, I think that is what we are talking now. When we get to the sanction level, mm. that uh, for me, that's where I was talking about the radical part, the surgery that we are talking about, mm. the cutting off, and uh, that is an area that really we want to up our game in. Because if these children that we are trying to bring up 
in the right way, mm. are not seeing examples at the top. And instead, what they are seeing and hearing is only negative. You have done zero work. Mm. Because children learn more by sight mm. than by hearing. Mm. So if they are hearing one thing and seeing another, then we are in a losing game. So the radical part of it is at the top with you and I, who are adults. Mm. Uh, that's why I was talking about the calling, the mm. sanctions, and so on. So in that area is where we have been dealing nicely with, uh, we don't want to embarrass you, so we will say there's an officer mm. in, in standard group mm. uh, that has done this and the other, but nobody who know, knows who that. Chairman, we're not embarrassing okay. people. We're just saying what they've no, done. No, I'm just saying. I'm saying that's the approach we we have been using. Now you're changing it. Now we have to change it so that Doing the like surgery, the DCI route, surgery. hold a card, yes, charge stealing, <laughs> embezzlement, <laughs> out, thug. <laughs> so you 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 may have noticed that in yeah. the last few weeks mm. that there are people who have been asked to step aside. Mm. Yes, uh, and and. Yeah, those are some of the things that we are actually doing. Mm. Yep. Asante Sana Bishop. We'll keep having this conversation with you. Let's fight the fight together. It's all for us as a country. Bishop Emeritus, Dr. David Oginde, Chairperson, Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission, 9 a.m. Morning, this is the news wire. I'm Lair Obaga. Hundreds of Kenyans have secured employment with fake certificates. ESEC Chairman David Oginde says something has to be done before the country degenerates to a worse situation. And it goes beyond that. There are people who have never seen the inside of a university but have degree certificates that they want to present to get jobs. And we have seen that at the lowest levels and the highest levels. We are sitting there in anti-corruption commission. One of the things we deal with is cases of people who have got jobs using fake certificates. And it is not two, three, four. It's in the hundreds cases that come to us. And you wonder why would anybody want to get a job for which they are not qualified? Oginde adds that parents and teachers are the main contributors of cheating in both primary and secondary school exams. Cheating in exams is almost expected. That's why we mobilize the whole army of the country to supervise that. Now we have come to the place where even with the seals and the containers, we still have to have security officers. And you ask yourself, where did little children in primary school learn about stealing exams? It is not them. It is their parents who buy these exams. It is their teachers who sell these exams. It is some unscrupulous people who do that and it has become almost normal for that to happen so that if there is no protection the exam would actually be flooded all around the country the ESCC chairman father says to end such cases of corruption that will tarnish the country's name there is need for Kenyans to fight it together so this culture of shortcut, get rich quickly, impatience in every place where we are is now what is driving us. And uh, in fact, when you do good, you are the one who is on the wrong. I've been hit many times talking about road because I stopped at the red lights. Where we are going if we don't do anything about it, and I'm talking about all of us as a nation, if we don't organize, organize ourselves, we are going to lose the place that we have because nobody wants to come and do business in a chaotic environment where there are no rules and where there's no order. With a bipartisan co-chair set to meet with Treasury CS Njugun and Dunga to discuss the rising cost of living, Mount Kenya leaders have vowed not to give the bipartisan talks report a pass if it fails to address the cost of living and multipartism. Led by Jubilee Secretary General Jeremiah Kioni and former Laikipia Governor Nderitu Muridi, by say the failure to address such matters will simply imply that the talks was just a waste of time. There is no need of talking about that document if it's not addressing the cost of living, or why would we bother with it? If it is not addressing the, the invasion uh, of Jubilee by Uda, what is the use of that document to us? We can continue managing ourselves the way you have done it. In any case, 
never Ruto never intended it for good. He's been wasting people's time there. But we also have been using the time to organize ourselves, including many things like you have seen. <laughs> we have no business at Bombers if those two basic minimums are not met. Reduction in the cost of living and uh, paying fidelity to the law as regards political party, leave Jubilee alone. Now Kenya leader Martha Karua adds that they won't stop fighting for the interest of Kenyans and the Mount Kenya region. We are united to push for the political, economic and social interests of the people of Mount Kenya. We will not accept politics of intimidation. Kama mtu anataka kutusafirisha kwenda binguni, pengine Mungu atamsafirisha mbele yetu. Lakini we are not going to be intimidated. And anybody who sends attack dogs to insult leaders asking how many votes we got, open the server. Mm. What are you fearing? Open the server. Open the server, we verify how many votes. Kama ni mbili tutashukuru. What are you afraid of? To assault rifles, seven heads of cattle have been recovered after a contingent of security personnel pursued suspected highway bandits after an attack at Malgis along the Malsherbet Isiono Highway. Malsherbet County Police Commander Patrick McHugh said the police also managed to recover 12 more heads of cattle, bringing to 19 the number of animals recovered so far out of the 25 stolen by the armed bandits. McHugh's father said that apart from the G3 rifles, the police also recovered five bullets, adding that no casualties or injuries were reported and a manhunt for the suspected criminals was still on. That's the news why I'm Lea Obaga. Ninety four point four Spice FM Nairobi. Okay, so we still have some traffic, different parts of the city. It's clogging up here and there. Um, still, coming out of Westlands is heavy. And on the thicker superhighway this morning, Outer Ring is bringing traffic to the thicker superhighway itself from Githurai. It's quite busy. Into the CBD, coming in from Jogo Road, Langata Road, Gong Road, and then also in from Westlands. Uh, so the city centre is pretty busy right about now. It's going to last that way for some time. Keep an eye on it, uh, even as the rains keep coming down in certain parts. Talk to us on Spice FM KE on X. This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom, in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is The Situation Room. The only way Seven to start your now. day. We're on to the final hour of the situation room. Uh-huh. School fees. Are you it's important for it? to yeah. keep saying this because it's the only one way of getting free money. But you, sh- you know that it will happen. At mm. the very least, you'll get into a draw, right? Yeah. So Kiwi says, you know what? Take a number on us. Go to the supermarket. Pick up a tin of the new logo Kiwi. You know, you and Riggi G same was up, eh? How? Oh. You only shop in supermarkets. Where any place where Kiwi is available, <laughs> yes, look better. for the that's logo. Better. Are you that's all right? Better. Thank yes. you very much. Mm. When you find it, you will then dial star two, sorry, star four five nine, star five hash. Mm. Okay? You follow those instructions and then you then get an opportunity to enter into the draw where four people every week are winning 35,000 shillings and um, they get an opportunity to win. Okay, so you do that. You also get an opportunity to get airtime. You get an opportunity to get data, Mm -hmm. school fees for January paid. Mm -hmm. Do it today. That's it. Yes. It's the way to go. That is it. This is something to consider. Mm. Sundio, 
Eh? It is. Very good. Consider it. This is the way to go. Okay. So we have invest, invited the managing director of the Kenya Investment Authority, Ken Invest, to look at uh, what Ken Invest is doing to attract FDI into the country. Mm. Uh, and not just FDI, but just uh, local investments as well. All the investments that need to be in invested in Kenya. Uh, June Chapkame will be joining us when she gets here. You know this rain and then traffic jam. Somebody <laughs> went and decided to dig a trench at the entrance to the Standard Group Center. So we now we have to tell people, Sasa, what you do? Unona yo mti. Ukifika kwa yo mti, unapiga kona hivi. Kuja, 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 kuja. Utapata umbwa. Ingia left, then you find the umbwa has left. <laughs> or you see the tree, then you find the tree has been cut down. The tree has been cut down. So now things just start, you know, changing and changing and changing. But as we wait for uh, her to get here, yeah, mm -hmm. see there are very many, these are big stories. And the big story today in the nation is with regards to the flooding across the country. Yeah. And it's a huge issue. And you, talk, you told us about it when you were reviewing the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Um, newspapers in the morning. This is this is beyond what we can just say. Okay, it's heavy rainfall. Yeah, this is destruction. It's destruction of property, lives lost, infrastructure being destroyed. As we watch, it's gonna be with us for a long time. And city, like you were saying yesterday, as you're seeing all these things happening. Uh, Expect disease as well. Yes, guaranteed. Guaranteed and loads mm. and loads of it. Mm. Because, I mean, if you're looking at this water and you're looking at it and a whole community that is waterlogged, what do you think is actually happening? These are communities. Some of these areas, let's mm -hmm. talk about Kisauni. Okay? Mm -hmm. You think they have a sewage system? Not really. So, they have soak pits. Okay? Mm. They are pit latrines. So, when you have this sort of water, what do you think happens? It's going to happen. That water that you see running, what do you think is inside that water? Mm. Okay? Now, how can you not then have disease? <sighs> Number one, even when you get rained on, you will. Mm. Talk about diseases that are brought about by people living in wet surroundings. Mm. Just forget about what is under the earth and what has been brought up because of this deluge. And then you talk about the plannings. The rains are Point, not pointing to us. They're giving us a 4D, 5D vision mm. of the inadequacy of our planning. And they're telling us, this is exactly how you planned. Mm. Now, there are those who argue, we couldn't have planned for this, but we were told. Is it the first time we've had heavy rains that have they, they destroyed things? No, it isn't. It isn't. It's just that this time around, for some people in living memory, they've never seen such rains before. Mm. Mm. If there had been preparations, even if they were inadequate, the damage that we're seeing would have been reduced. You know, even being where we are, I think right now what, what many would question is, is, does the government have a handle on this? Like, so yes, we hosted a uh, senior man, director at uh, Red Cross, and he told us, unlike very many other instances where he's been involved, this time he's seeing better coordination, mm. better coordination at national level, better coordination in terms of even other um, relief agencies coming in and being coordinated from one single structure. But question is, is that being felt across the country by all the people that are suffering? Is that being able to be scaled you know, immediately? There's yeah. an issue that is emerging. And those are the issues that you have to keep asking yourselves. What exactly is the kind of coordination that we are getting here? Do we see it? Do we because see it? Do must, we feel it? It must be manifest, isn't it? Yes. So where is it? If there was a coordinated <clears throat> effort, if there was something that everybody was saying, this is what we are going to do, should this happen in this, even if it does, this is what we've put in place to ensure that so, should something happen, this is how we're going to deal with it. If there was, we would be able to see it. Mm. But what are the cries that we've been hearing over the last couple of days? Mm. Now we're looking for relief food. We're looking for shelter where we can put people. What we're trying to do is make sure that we put things in place because of this one. It's already here. It's not a matter of it is coming. It is here, right here, and it is happening. And it's unfortunate that here we are yet again in another situation whereby there could have been something that should have been done, but it was not done. And now we're dealing with 
greater levels of destruction. Mm -hmm. Like you said, the number would have been reduced. The amount, the severity would have been reduced if actually it had been done. Mm. Is this the first place on the world to have been met by floods? No. No. This is the first time the world is experiencing a lino. No. No. And it's just, I, don't, I do not know what's going to get us to that point whereby mm. um, we actually prepare for a, a rainy day. Mm. Oh, no pun intended, but really do prepare and make sure that it, these things that we can do are actually sorted she, she out. She had asked the question, does the government have a handle on this thing? Mm. Well, if they did, what are the signs that they do? I don't know. That's, I think that's, that's, that's where the government often fails in terms of communication. Mm. Okay? Because they may probably actually have things that they're doing, you know, in those severely affected areas that even the local leaders of those areas do not know about because we saw the leaders from ASAL speaking just the other day. Yeah. Was it yesterday or the, the day before Saying yesterday? that they had not received any money from yeah. them. Yeah. These leaders from ASAL led by uh, Kainan, the governor of, of, of Mandera, the governor of Wajia, the leaders of, of uh, Garissa, they're all coming out to say, you know what, we need more better concerted effort. At, that shows that they are not in the room. That even if there's a coordinating mechanism, these particular leaders of these areas are not in the room coordinating this, me this mechanism. No, mm. they're not. Because if they were, they would be able to tell us about it. Yeah, they should be talking about it. We did not see governors coming out during COVID times, speaking outside, saying, you know what, we know what. Because they, it was very clear. It had been announced. The Central Committee was dealing with Yes, matters. and every time there were queries that were unsubstantiated, you knew who to ask. Yeah. And you'd say, the vaccines are here, we'd say, okay, where exactly where are, are they? they? And, and where can told. people access them? And you'd be told. If we look back at the COVID, the implementation of it and the questions, very many questions notwithstanding, at least on the communication front, they got it right. They, they got it right because we knew that there is a national emergency response committee. We did. We knew that the chair of this is the cabinet secretary for health. We did. We knew that on a daily basis, the, Nash, the cabinet secretary for health his two CASs, the Director General for Health, and the other directors for sanitation, blah, and even blah, blah, the PS, blah, and the PS is they were there. there, and we knew what we were hearing from them, right? And then we also knew that there's another coordinating team that even has military officers and all that is dealing with, you know, security, making sure that the curfew is imposed and it's being all that we knew. Yes, they when even had a committee of experts who knew exactly, exactly what to do with regarding these diseases. People who had conducted research, people whose area of speciality these microbes were, yes. and they would talk about it. Yes, yes. So we had this kind of you know feeling of all right. So the government, at least we know who is advising the president on this, who's answering questions on this. If questions are to be asked in parliament, we know uh, Susan Mochache will go and answer these questions. We knew. Yes. Who's dealing with this matter? Yes. When vaccines started arriving, we knew, all right, so vaccines will arrive at JKIA, they'll immediately be taken to Kitengela. Yes. In Kitengela, we have the big cold storage facility. From Kitengela, they'll be taken across the country. Yes. To, we, kni we knew. At, we knew. Even if there were issues, we knew. At least we knew. When they were given the five billion and were wondering where it went, we knew, we knew. there was five billion. Yes. And we knew what was expected, so we knew what to question. This particular time, the deputy president is chairing the response to the El Nino and its effects. Yes, he is. Okay. We have heard that. We have heard he met and he has had meetings with governors, this and the other. But on a regular basis, on what they are doing, as the floods continue, as the roads get become impassable, we are not hearing, okay, so this road to Modogashe is now becoming impassable, so this is what's going to happen to the people who need to travel. To Nairobi, the people who need to travel for medical uh, emergencies because somebody was undergoing dialysis and they, they need to go to, for dialysis. This is what the Ministry of Health is doing to ensure that this person gets dialysis. If this person is going for chemotherapy or cancer treatment, this is what the Ministry of Health is doing. All right, the children will be going to school uh, and they're sitting their exams. The children who are sitting their exams, Ministry of Education, this is what they're doing. The road is blocked off. Kipchumba Murkomen and the road agencies, this is what they're doing. We don't hear it. And we know we should. Because if, should say, be something like the, daily. the river, the Athi River, okay, mm. or even the Mtitonde River, burst its banks, you know, the roads become impossible. It yep. means if you're driving to Mombasa, you need to know. You need to know. If there is a river anywhere in the country that bursts its <clears> banks, 
it means that road becomes impassable. It doesn't, there's nothing that stops the government from telling us exactly this is a hot spot. Mm. You need to avoid this. This is what you need to do. Now, the media reports on it. Yep. But then the government input that the media could be reporting on, saying this is what the government is saying, that is not there. That's what we're lacking. It's not there. That's what we need. We need to know. So, for example, if you wanted to cross over into Tanzania um, from um, what's that border point called in Kuala? You're talking about, um, <laughs> yeah. how can I actually forget? <laughs> yes. Lunga Lunga. Lunga. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and this bridge has now, water has stopped the bridge. Mm. So the road is now impassable. We've actually blocked the road. Yes. So what is the message? What's the communication? If you must not travel to Tanzania at this time, please change your travel plans. Or a national announcement. Or, look for or if you must, then this is the road that Kenha has identified. For vehicles to use yes those that are carrying goods and those goods are important to be transported across the border this is where they're using do we instead hear that of, instead of going to longa longa go to taveta yes okay this is a coordination that we need to be hearing from our government what we're hearing from our government is other stories is it difficult apparently what is i mean what is difficult exactly communicating yeah i think the communication part of it is difficult mm. but i think it's just be, it's beyond the communication here in the actual doing um of some of these things um just let's, let's take the last two weeks mm. so what happened last week and what's happening this week mm. okay let's not even talk about the rain that came before that if from what we saw uh, in the coastal counties mombasa uh kwale Lamu, those three alone. Mm. And then the rain maybe gave let up for a day or two, right? Yep. So the floodwaters that had come in, they went and they found somewhere to settle. The puddles were still there. The rain came back on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then now here we are on Tuesday and it's done the same thing overnight. You have seen the pattern. You have seen what is going to happen. They've even said to us that it is going to continue like this for the foreseeable future. And this foreseeable is about a month. Mm. Is it an impossibility to do something about it? Because let's ask a simple question. What's the problem in Mombasa? We've been told that there's a drainage issue, right? It's more, yep. than, it's more than just a drainage We've issue. We've been told that there's an mm -hmm. infrastructure issue. It is more We've than been told about the issue. age of the town. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, that the structures in the town will not allow mm. for the proper passage of water mm. because it is possible in a place that has been properly structured or at least been tinkered with a little bit, the passage of water does not become a nuisance mm. when it rains or whatever. It doesn't become a nuisance because it's been properly planned. We knew the rain was coming. Yep. Would it have been so? And there are people who can tell you they're, they're, they're here. There's, they're, there are people who can tell you this is what you do. We're not asking you to destabilize the entire city, but we're saying do this, this, and this mm. so that water can flow and find its natural force, uh, uh, source or find its natural path back mm. to, you know, where, where it should be and doesn't affect life in the manner in which it has. Mm. But I can bet you the hope is, fingers crossed, knock on woods, that folks are saying, you know what, this rain will end at some point and this problem that we are seeing now will finish. Yeah. And that's a big issue whereby you're saying the rain is temporary. So why do we need to do anything permanent, spend a lot of money, make ourselves uncomfortable in the meantime to sort out this issue when the rain is not going to last forever? If you ask me, these are all tied into the conversations that we've had this morning. This rain is lasting. Okay. These are mm. all tied into conversations. It will not that we've be forever, today. but this rain is lasting. Yeah. And if you look at the frequency mm. and the intensity with which this rain is coming down, mm. this is not something you want to have a little chit chat about. Mm. See, as it rains, it's causing more damage. And it's not as though it's raining in drips. Yep. It's pouring down. Yep. In torrents. So everything that we're discussing here is an emergency. It's not a little problem mm -mm. that we can wish away. No. Nope. Yeah. So what then are we going to do when disease strikes and suddenly you're talking about lives being lost? Not just to the water, now because of disease. So you have water causing a problem, then you have diseases. And then you have people displaced. And then you have people who've lost property. 
you know when the disease will come it is not now no it's when that water has pooled for some time and it will do so yes the water that was an issue for people in mombasa has not gone away no it hasn't so it's pooled for some time and then you have this collection of pockets of water you it will rear its ugly head guess what in the next six or so five or so weeks just read what it takes in the next five or so weeks when what is happening when children are going back to school then what are you going to do then what's going to happen and in some places that the schools will not be in existence anymore yeah i mean there's a lot that there's a lot that's happening right now mm. a lot in terms of even destruction just imagine the people who have been displaced mm. so how do we how how are they going to get back mm. on their footing what about those roads that have actually been swept away meaning there was a road here uh, it's no longer exists so meaning you're cut off yeah so then then what do you do we have to build those roads mm. 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 this is why you, you look back and you ask yourself is the government doing this deliberately you know just saying okay we are not going to focus on this because if you focus on this this is a one big problem we we, we don't want to focus the attention of the country on All this right. well, so we are going to divert the attention okay. of the country and one of the things that we hope to do is you know just the president casually saying you know mungu ni nani yeah. god has told him that yeah. it's not going to rain but yes now unfortunately it rains this but much Eric, and now the god a- if you ask me a question expecting one answer and i decide to answer another one what am i telling you <laughs> You don't want to answer it. Uh-huh. I'm not ans- in fact I'm not You're going avoiding to deal the question. Completely. I'm not going to deal with that issue and I'm going to wish it away by focusing on that other thing. I don't have to tell you to your face that I'm mm. not interested. My actions will show you. And it is look it's blaring mm. every time. Silence is a, is an answer. It is actually communication. It a very is effective telling one. you something. What value are you placing on the thriving of individuals, of families, of communities? We're not talking about three. Three is, is three too many. Mm. We're talking about 80,000 already and the rain has not stopped. And it's not about to stop. We're talking about 20 Kenyans dead. Now, look, we are saying that the destruction and the severity of it could have been reduced. We are saying that right now in the middle of the turmoil there is still something that can be done. But what have we heard? We need help. The governors, the executive of Kwale County are saying we need help. Lamu, we need help. Mombasa saying we actually didn't receive anything. The Northern County saying we actually didn't receive anything. We need help. Are you kidding? For something that we were told about 3 months ago. It's not a joke. 3 months ago. And we were told EACC in the name of one CEO Twali what did he tell county governors this money that you people have been given for mitigation efforts let me not see that any of you have used it or misappropriated it because we will come for you so there was some kind of action somewhere but it did not result in anything no let me ask this action that we're speaking of i mean i'm not going to give credit where it doesn't exist okay what exactly was done which one? okay the money did it land somewhere did it go to somebody what did they do with it what what action what action what did they do with it We just know that there was money supposedly where where did what, it go What seems to be a trend is that there's a conversation about it about some money somewhere Yes there's a conversation then there's a conversation about mitigation conversation When you ask we've heard what where show okay you're given more conversation mm. so now the rains are upon us this is not a conversation it's a reality The effects of the rain are not a conversation they are it's a reality So then what do we do with these realities Mm-mm. because <laughs> the health system is going to be challenged like it has not been challenged in a very very long time properly yep. and you're talking about a health system that already has challenges yep properly okay what are we going to do take your pick malaria typhoid cholera which one new money bill has yeah new money pneumonia which mm. one which what do you want it mm. to look like on monday tuesday take your pick mm. that's what we're talking about here mm. that's the severity we're talking about malaria still the world number one killer in terms of disease there because of this this is what we're talking about is going to multiply in counties whereby its prevalence is still through the roof yes so that's now there's a multiplicity of this prevalence that's what we're talking about and it's not to, it's not to be debbie downers or doomsday uh, protagonist we just yes. uh, perverse we're just saying you know what look here yeah, this is the thing in this room we talked about the severity of a weather situation that comes after a severe drought we talked about it in this room and the hope was that you know what guys it is coming 
Let's do something about it. It is coming. These cries that we're hearing, they were coming. It was going to happen. What are we doing? And we explained. And we spoke. And we brought in experts. And they spoke. And we heard of mitigation. You know, the if this was a subject that had never been spoken of, mm. and we're talking about a subject that is not understood, mm. then we'd be saying, you know, this thing caught us by surprise. This didn't catch us by surprise. Nope. No, it didn't. Nope. It nope. did not. Scholars, we had a scholar here in April who said, you see this drought that we're having? We've experienced long season of drought. And and it will be followed by severe floods. rains. It yes. will. The same severity of the drought yep. will be responded to by severity of rain yep. and water. Kenya Met, has, we had the director just the other day, said since February we started noticing the El Nino phenomenon. We saw the likelihood of it. By June, we had confirmed with no uncertainty, with little certainty, yes. that this is going to happen. happen. Yes. And they communicated it. And they communicated. Yes, they did. And that's where the meeting took place. And the meeting discussed money. Anyway, let's take a break. It's 29 <sighs> minutes past nine. Kenya's biggest conversation by Kiwi. Why? Because you mm. can pay school fees. That's I know it, it sounds like one equals plus one equals two, it but it actually that's what it is. Mm -hmm. You what number one is you go to where this kiwi is being sold. It can yes. be in your shop, supermarket, mm -hmm. wherever you shop. Mm -hmm. The new logo, that's one. Mm -hmm. And then you dial the number, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Then you add plus. Mm -hmm. The other one is now when you dial, put in the code equals to school fees. School fees. Thirty five thousand shillings, four people winning every week, thirty five thousand shillings goes to a school fees come January. You can do this as many times as you want. Actually, you can. Underline in red mm. and write Q E D. This is the situation room. The only way to start your day. It's critical that people pay taxes. But then taxation has to have a limit. When you start overtaxing people beyond certain limit, then this is now we call robbery with violence. We are all struggling, but we don't show. If you're not doing well, shame on you. But you have to say, I'm broke and I'm struggling. <laughs> we are not okay until everybody is okay. okay. We are pretending to have political parties. Why don't we just be honest? And we say, these are the Luhias, these are the Kambas, these are the Kikuyus, and we are find ourselves in Kenya. You know, with, with politics and leadership, no matter what you do, <laughs> there will always be a complaint. <laughs> there will always be the assumption that you you're either stealing or you're not doing things right. As a leader, don't fear. If you know you're doing the right thing, you've thought about it, you've got an expert advice, do it, then understand later. This country, we don't need prayers. Prayers mm. is between you and God. Good governance and thinkers who care about the country and not their stomach. Yes. That's what we need. The Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation. Okay, so we're looking at rainy conditions still continuing in Nairobi this morning. Looks like it will continue for most parts of the day. Uh, looking into then a rainy Nakuru going to highs of 26. And then we'll see the rain continuing um, into... My thing is here. Rain continuing into other parts of the city. Uh, 16 degrees in... Nyeri going to highs of 22 and then looking into Eldoret mostly cloudy at 16 highs of 22 it continues to rain in Mombasa at 26 with highs of 31 and highs of 31 as well in a cloudy Malindi uh, looking into Kisumu it's mostly cloudy at 22 with highs of 27 and Kakamega going to highs of 25 currently at 19. Kampala heavy rain continues at 19 into highs of 27 and the rain shower is also coming down in Dar es Salaam with highs of 31. Mogadishu sunny at 28 with Addis sunny at 16. Into Johannesburg is partly sunny at 20 and 25 and mostly clear in Lagos. Light rain showers continue in Kinshasa at 24, going to highs of 30. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice FM, Nairobi. When you're impeached, you're impeached. When you're sentenced, you're sentenced. Madam Chief Justice. Until the sentence is uh, set aside. Ukibeba vitu kwa roho utakufa. If you carry things in your heart, you will die. <laughs> 
the reason for which you went to school yeah. and then ga- 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 you know gathered experience yes. that reason must be paid for oh right <laughs> oh okay <laughs> This level ship up oh, or boy. ship out. Levels don't change. No, no, it's yeah, about ship. shipping up. You know my business partner here. Yeah. Shipping out. Are we talking about the <laughs> ship in the bathtub or, <laughs> or the ship man? <laughs> I want to tell a story of the studio. No in school. And they've been told to write a composition about a ship. This classmate raises a hand. Teacher, are you talking about the ship? Ship or a ship and goat? <laughs> situation okay so still continues rain is coming down um still in nairobi traffic continues on the thicker superhighway it's still heavy as you touch on the pangani underpass and we've got some movement then coming in from westlands that looks to be almost the end of it but still keeping an eye on things and hoping you help us out here as well spice fm ke on x let's keep things moving and we talk there Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 24.4 Spice yeah. FM, Nairobi. Our guest has arrived and she's here now. June Chepkeme Chep is the managing director of the Kenya Investment Authority. June, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Kenya's biggest conversation. Thank you. Happy it's, to be here. It's the hot seat of the situation room. So, first of all, why are you late? Um, traffic. No, there was no traffic in Nairobi, actually. Mm. Uh, this is my third meeting of the day. Okay. So why are you late for the third meeting? <laughs> because I knew that you have to read news at nine. Mm. So uh, unfortunately for you, I've worked in the studio before and mm. I know the programming. So mm. I'm convinced that I'm on time. Hey. <laughs> 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 Ask and you shall be told. Okay. Still. Okay. Mm-hmm. So for the next 26 minutes or so, let's have this conversation. Right. First of all, getting straight into it. What is Kenya Invest, the Kenya Investment Authority? So Kenya Investment Authority is actually an investment promotion agency uh, that was established by the government of Kenya in the year 2004 to support investment promotion, facilitation, and to support the investment climate in the country to attract investors. Mm. So we are actually an agency uh, who is mandated with uh, supporting the growth of the economy Okay. through investment attraction. An investment attraction, therefore, we mean FDI. Both FDI, which is foreign direct investment, mm-hmm. and DDI, which is domestic direct investment. Okay. So on a daily basis, what is it that you do then to attract investment? First, we package opportunities that are investable, those that investors can look into and put their money in. Uh, Secondly, is to take them out there and promote in either forums or through sessions that we have with our investors. And thirdly, we um, facilitate existing investors by providing them what we call aftercare. We visit their premises understand what it is that they're uh, struggling with or if they're looking for expansion, what can we do for them and uh, collate that information to inform policy. And uh, lastly, we just create awareness of Kenya as an attractive investment destination. Mm -hmm. Which of those functions and roles do you end up doing most of in a year? If you look at, you know, the number of activities that you've had, is it of promoting is it of collating and curating investable opportunities or is it the aftercare and the pre-care for investors a lot of it is really facilitation where we receive um, investors coming to kenya investment authority to be supported to register to get work permits to get approvals and all all that so for, for instance this financial year we facilitated 179 projects with um, an FDI. Uh, this financial year, the current one or 
so the that concluded one. so the, the the financial year ends in june mm. every year so it starts in july to june so as at june we had facilitated and facilitation means mm. you're registering them helping them set up a company get them all the approvals whether it's, it's, it's county government approvals name approvals regulatory approvals even supporting them to get a premise or to set up a factory uh, until they they have presence in the country so we did 178 projects mm. uh, and these have a capital outlay of 74 billion kenya shillings mm. so are we looking at this money that comes in over a year or how what time period are we looking at the investment and then now the business activity that takes place for these organizations in the country over a period of time or is it one off you know what that's a fantastic question because that's where um, most of us l lose the appreciation of how what it takes or how long it takes for fdi to land mm -hmm. an investor will set to move into a country with a certain capital um, uh, investment and they would then say that you're looking to put say um, 10 million dollars in the next five years in, in in this economy or in whichever period of time mm -hmm. so these that we are looking at um, is for a certain period of time maybe at a minimum th uh, within three years mm. to five years when the investors begin to then see return on their investment mm. so fdi does not land pap the 74 billion it lands over time yeah mm. but the 178 projects that you facilitated are already in country they're already in country but they haven't now fully established and started operating so there are different stages of establishment mm. now we've also heard that one of the things that you have to do also in basically in attracting foreign direct investment mm -hmm. is you've got to go into those markets to start dealing with investors in those markets and showcasing kenyan investable opportunities mm -hmm. how do you do that do you organize road shows is it you you attend trade fairs in other countries Okay, so a majority of the missions are actually um, organized and you're invited, sometimes as a country or a ministry is invited. Then we go with opportunities that are either sector specific or reflect uh, what that particular uh, jurisdiction is looking for in, in a country like Kenya. Um, most of them are organized and they are not trade shows. Remember, there's a difference between trade and investment. Uh, with regards to trade, we have our sister agency called Keproba that then supports the um, trading uh, and retail aspect of, 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 uh, of our products. Mm. But for us, we go out there to tell them, come to Kenya. Mm. We have a market in Kenya. We have a market in East Africa. We are a market in Africa. And we provide you access to the rest of the world. Okay. So when you establish in Kenya, you then begin to produce and take it out or you can sell it internally. Mm. So that's really what we do. Why is it necessary to do so much hand-holding for these organizations? Does it say something about a system that is not seamless? Because you talked about helping them get this documentation. Mm -hmm. okay. They need help to do this, get this permit, get this license. Why would you need to help them out so much? Think about it this way. Pick a country. Estonia. You need to go to Estonia. What comes to your mind? And you're taking your money to Estonia. Mm -hmm. What do you do? I need to buy a plane ticket. Fantastic. I need a visa. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. How do you get the visa? I go to the embassy uh -huh. and apply uh -huh. with my relevant documentation. So when you land in Estonia, what happens? Do you go to Google Map and figure out where do I invest? Well, the assumption is that previously I've had a conversation with the people that I'm going to Fantastic. start with. And yeah. that is Estonia Investment Authority. Mm -hmm. Chances are. Mm -hmm. So when you land in a new country as a as a as a as a foreigner looking mm -hmm. to invest and like a tourist, mm -hmm. you then need to go to that entity that points you to everyone you need mm -hmm. at one go. Mm -hmm. That's why we and hold them. Mm -hmm. They would still do it, but it will take mm -hmm. them a longer time figuring out, so where is Kenya Revenue Authority? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine for a foreigner, even the thought of, of opening a bank account is tedious, not just in Kenya, anywhere I in the world, because you then need paperwork, where do I get this paperwork, and this and that, yep. and then which bank, even mm -hmm. just recommendation of which bank will then um, support me to register. So that is why we hold them, and the reason we also focus a lot on holding them is want to leave a, a positive taste so they feel that we are welcoming and we are more supportive and facilitative as a country so it's the impression you also want to leave and encourage them because they feel that they are supported mm. what do you do about the you one could, could call them few 
mm-hmm. but any number of negative reviews that you receive mm-hmm. by investors who are seeking to invest in this country and set up in country for example we've had at a presidential event mm-hmm. in the uh, former administration an investor standing up and saying you know what i've been seeking to invest in this country mm-hmm. for a long time mm-hmm. and i have just been given the run around by mm-hmm. government officers mm-hmm. i'm told i need to go and get this like this permit and another permit and i start i'm told you know mm-hmm. b- before you got this permit you ought to have gotten three other permits mm-hmm. basically just being taken on a run around mm-hmm. and it takes long for them to invest I'm talking about one that invested recently mm-hmm. at um, Dongo Kundu mm-hmm. and this is Taifa Gas. Mm-hmm. He had spoken in the whole time and said mm-hmm. I'm getting frustrated. We've had Dangote try to come here. Mm-hmm. Oh one, two, three, four, five, they just gave up and moved away. Okay. What do you do about that because that then dents the image of Kenya as an investment <laughs> destination. So we have had cases and some actually are uh, investors that decide to fly to Estonia they pick a ticket and they fly mm. and then they land anywhere and that's why we are pointing them to land at Kenya Investment Authority if you land at Kenya Investment Authority then it's our job to then point you to Dongo Kundu because what is Dongo Kundu the, the, the foreigner will google Dongo Kundu and, and take pick a plane ticket to go to Mombasa and then they find themselves in the middle of nowhere but when you come to Kenya Invest and we are able to to tell you that actually Dongo Kundu is by is a special economic zone so we take you to the special economic zone authority and we are then supported to land at Dongo Kundu or or simply for for your kind of investment we think you should be at Tatu City because when you are at Tatu City these are the auxiliary support infrastructure or or or, or a market or access that will then fit you or you're supposed to be in Naivasha or whichever part of the country so the challenge has been and and we have to admit we have not come out strongly as Kenya Investment Authority to be the one stop one go center for investors to then avoid the this in land, or the first port of call because they end up landing in the hands of consultants or other uh, interest groups that will then um, end up um, um, pushing them around and it, it leaves them wondering whether this country is really ready for investors but let me mention that um, at least for the few months I've been at Ken Invest a majority of the complaints that we get are people looking for tenders and people who are trading let's face it and let's love our country enough to speak up and say you are a trader you're not an investor you've spent two years in Kenya looking for a tender and you are complaining that you want to invest that is not an investment no that is trading and of course retail and wholesale is also a form of i mean uh, investment attraction look at the economy like united states of america it's purely driven by tr- um, retail and wholesale but when you come to kenya and you're looking to sell to government mm. and, and you, you you're not getting that uh, breakthrough because i mean selling then comes with different uh, legal um, requirements mm. but then that you conclude that uh, this country is not is not attractive enough so we've had also confusion between trading and investment and uh, we've had to be extremely tough and say we need to be uh, bold and pro- provide red carpet to people who are bringing money to this country produce in country sell in country so if for instance you want to sell us gas mm. we are happy to facilitate you to get a gas market but first set up that facility in Kenya let it be made in Kenya and we will hold your hand as Kenya invest and take you to that market and even convince government to provide you uh with a, with with a, with a market so that you can de risk your investment i'm a bit confused on these matters of business especially when matters is concerned i am a bit slow so okay. I, i sometimes miss a point mm-hmm. say someone comes and invest mean they come and set up a factory mm-hmm. that's an investment correct now when they start selling their whatever it is they're producing are they not trading they're trading okay so when we say there are people who just come to trade and not invest mm-hmm. then and you say they're looking for tenders mm-hmm. but i'm assuming that if i set up a factory and i'm mm-hmm. selling something mm-hmm. i will still be dealing with tenders at some point correct okay So, so the, the, this person okay now mm-hmm. break it down for me so that i understand yes I, and i don't think you're slow so if you again pick a product that you want to invest in you want me to pick a product yes. yeah 
that I want to invest in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, mm, anything I want. <laughs> Pick okay. tires. Okay, tires. Uh, actually, I was thinking of tires. Okay. Think of oh, tires. oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, tires. Mm -hmm. huh? So you walk into you walk into the country and you're looking for a market to sell tires. Uh, these tires, you're importing them ready, 100%. Uh, from another jurisdiction. So what you're looking is to set up a warehouse. Correct. Here. So the, what you've done is to set up a warehouse and uh, we are busy struggling with your custom clearance and A, B, C, D, and D. So you're not really adding value that we, we, we particularly are interested in. Uh, not necessarily because all you're doing is to sell. And anybody yeah. can do that in Kenya. Anybody, any Kenyan can go out there and buy tires and set up um, a warehouse oh, right. and sell. Yeah. Okay. And you need to be given preferential treatment. Oh, so you want preferential treatment because you're bringing tires? Mm. No, I don't no you're a foreigner bringing tires. I don't think we're going to give you preferential treatment. So, <laughs> Sorry. we have to agree that we are not a consumer. Because we build a consumer economy in this country. We have facilitated markets for products made in other jurisdictions. And we continue to do that. And when government says, no, we are going to levy taxes on this so that those companies can consider doing it in Kenya because it's cheaper, uh, and, then, and so you create jobs, then we begin to bash government and say, you are killing us with taxes. So maybe we need to interrogate a little bit some of these decisions that are made because we want to make it cheaper to produce tires in Kenya and mostly expensive to import tires to the country. Mm, it's called protection and right. I think it's allowable. But and we are a liberal economy. Even with a liberal economy, we have to protect our industries. Now we are together. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy with that. Yes, because liberal economy or not, there is no, even the most liberalized economies on the planet protect their own industries. Good. Mm. Why should one come to your office as can invest? Must one come to your office as can invest? Why must one come to my office? Because one, we will provide you with legit opportunities that have been vetted and exist. Two, we will um, link you with every single part of um, either government entity or agency that will support you to land from helping you with that visa to come to the country as an investor, help you with that permit for you to do your business in this country, help you register that company or incorporate it, help you with that license that you need either from a county government or um, a regulatory body, whether it's IRA or NEMA or CESA or uh, EPZ license, we will point you to where you need to be and you will cut the time that you will take to land and secondly, we do it free of charge. How long will that take? To do what? It that depends. entire process that you've said. So for I example, am an investor. I want to come and set up a tire manufacturing factory mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, obviously, as an investor, I've done a bit of my due diligence. Mm -hmm. Is there a market in this area? Yes, mm -hmm. maybe if I uh, start from Kenya, mm -hmm. I can sell in the region and mm -hmm. this and the other. What would be the best area for me to do that? Mm -hmm. Everybody is concentrated in Nairobi. I want to go to Nakuru. Okay. To go. So I have done a bit of that. Mm. So I come to Ken Invest and I say, mm. I want to set up a factory in mm -hmm. this and such area mm -hmm. to do tires. I want you to walk with me through that journey. How long ideally should mm. this journey take? Um, first of all, it takes you um, at a minimum of two days to get that permit to come to, to the country. And it will take you another two days at maximum to incorporate your company because we do it at Ken Invest. We have business registration services there. Mm -hmm. That's the maximum. Now we've set you up. You're ready to do business. But then you probably would be looking for either you rent a facility or you want to buy land or you want... Actually, you probably need a facility. Yeah. So if, for example, you want to do it in Nakuru, we will recommend what as government we can close which is set up at SEZ Naivasha. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's SEZ Naivasha, it's within our control, and within a month, we've managed to get you all the licenses because it's government facility, mm -hmm. and we'll give you a rate. We'll be able to support you connect with power, water, and the rest. Now, if you are coming to set up in a private pro property, we'll take you to that facility, say Tattoo, then the, the, the processes applicable to that private entity is what you will then have to go by. And sometimes you get stuck in negotiating the rates and the rest that ideally 
is is beyond our control as government but for those that we have control over especially if you are setting up either at Konza or you are setting up at our SEZ or you are setting at our EPZ then that we can close with the shortest time possible depending on what it is that you need but remember we need to always get you a uh, regulatory approval for example NEMA so if you're getting an EMA approve, uh, regulatory approval, you need to then appoint your technical team to submit documents. Mm. Most investors get stuck there. They either appoint the wrong team mm. or, or they delay in appointing a team or they simply are in the wrong site that will then not get approval. Then we, we get lost in that and it can easily be translated to mean doing business in Kenya mm. is not as smooth as it should be. Okay, in terms of the numbers of folks who've come in and then gotten the necessary support um, from Ken Invest, are those now today viable projects, viable investments, whereby you can point back and say, actually, you know what, because of the facilitation that was provided by Ken Invest, we can see this portfolio one, two, three, mm -hmm. four. What kind of numbers are we looking at? And can we point to each of them and say that actually they are actually providing something toward the economy and then would serve as a case study for others to come in. Oh, we have amazing case studies. I um, visited one of two months ago in Mombasa that set up a biscuit manufacturer. You know the value that a simple bis biscuit factory brings to the economy? First of all, you get our wheat, you buy our wheat, you buy our sugar, you buy our water, and then you then begin to consume our power, you create jobs, and then the logistics, you know, um, the, 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 the companies that then buy your biscuits and distribute to the different parts of the country. A perfect case study, and they're now expanding. Um, recently, the, we were having a session, we, we have round tables with different uh, embassies to just look at the investors. And there's this company that came with them. Um, I think, it, I think it was Israeli, Israeli ambassador to our office. And as we were engaging, this gentleman said, hey, I came to Kenya. I was planning to uh, set up here and wait for a bit, about two years to see return on my investment. But I'm profitable in six months. Mm -hmm. Thanks to the support I received, the handholding, I was quickly supported to settle. So we have uh, fa fantastic, fantastic case studies. But I need to mention that uh, we are not the only agency that... Uh, facilitate investors. Why? Because the Investment Act of 2004, which is an old act, removed mandatory registration of investors by Kenya Investment Authority. Mm. And therefore, as a country, we may not have total visibility, especially from the Kenya Invest point of view, of who has come, especially those, those who come through other channels. Please note that there are entities in this country who simply do investment, um, facilitation, structuring, and all that as a business. Yep. So, so some come through those ent entities, and they, they are different, but those that at least come through can invest have had good, good um, stories. Mm. So you're saying that our laws have allowed can invest to have competitors? Not, not competitors because we are the only government agency, but it is not mandatory to register at Ken Invest. So you can come and Latif holds your hand and tells you, hey, I know a place you can invest in in my village and you go invest there and we have And no I do my due diligence and yeah. I find it makes uh, sense and, and I go ahead and invest. Yeah. The question though is, does Ken Invest have some collaboration or network with these other entities? Good. Does it open up its doors for yeah. these other entities to also come and maybe benefit from can invest services we had before but we had not strengthened it enough and built the value that will want will make them want to partner with us mm. so what have we done we have um come up with the investment facilitation framework which we are uh, being supported by undp and world bank to then clarify the investor journey number one but create a point of convergence for the for the um, for the partners in that especially this um entities that facilitate in they do structuring which we cannot do we don't have that capacity as government and we would not would not want to do it so if we have a, um, what we call lead a lead is an opportunity that has not been uh, structured to investment in uh, investment grade yep. what we call bankable opportunity then you come in as a as a partner and you work with us to structure it within the structure then you have your what we call success fee that you will then uh, be paid once you've secured 
the deal. Mm. So we are creating that within our facilitation framework and we are digitizing it. Why? So that we are able to track who is this that is handling which investor. And if an investor is either mistreated or they lose their investment or they find uh, themselves in wrong hands, we can trace and tell and, and know who is this that has misled the investor. So we've created that framework and uh, we will be inviting these players, different players within the investment uh, ecosystem to then be part of this journey. So that as Kenya Investment Authority, we play more of a coordination role uh, than the really going down there and trying to do what the private sector can do. Okay. We hosted your Principal Secretary for Investment here, Abu Bakar, some time back. Just remind us the targets that you have in terms of annual investment attraction. Hmm? Just remind us the target. <laughs> we have a target of 10 billion US dollars. Mm. 10 billion USD. This year? Um, but I don't know whether, you know, I can't contradict my boss, but we have a target of 10 uh, billion dollars. We don't remember over, actually over, whether over it over the, the, It's over, 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 over five time, years. Mm. Time, yes. So it comes to about 2 billion, if we say over five years, 2 billion per year. Mm. That's 200 billion shillings. You did 74 in the just concluded financial year. So now you have another 200 billion to do. Where? It's calling, having your work cut out for you. Where? Mm. But we, we, we have a strategy. Mm -hmm. I, must, I must say we didn't have a strategy before, but we now have a strategy that uh, will allow us to package what we call uh, brownfields. Brownfields are existing opportunities. Let's take, for example, this, this media house. Yeah. You're looking for an investor. This is a brownfield. It's an easy sell. Mm -hmm. We're able to come, sit, and look at uh, the opportunity and go out there and say, within our, our business, here is the gap. Now we are looking for an investor that can fill this gap. Yeah. Well, that's an easy sell. You close it very fast. Green fields are projects like Konza that takes time to, 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 to then mature and land. Um, uh, look at a project like Tatu. Mm. Tatu has both brown and, 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 uh, and, and green field. Um, so we want to focus more on brown field. Uh, look at existing opportunities that can be used to tap investment mm. and the privatization commission has started some of these companies that are privatizing are examples of of brownfields that will then help us land investors but just to be honest with you as a country we must land investors if we are to create jobs for these million young kenyans that are not um that that are, are struggling can i just say one more thing yeah as you wind up a few years ago you would see um, a huge number of Kenyans working towards industrial area because the, the, the industrial area was thriving. We had factories actually manufacturing. What we have done is to close those factories and build go-downs for products to be shipped to the country. We must reverse that. If we do not reverse that, then we will not be where we need to be as a country. Thank you. Jin Chepkemoi is the Managing Director of Kenya Investment Authority. Thank you for joining us. Next time, we'll hope Hopefully start on time. Be nice. I have more time. <laughs> 10 a.m. Thank, you, thank you very much for tuning into the Situation Room today. See you again tomorrow. Here is the news. The national KCSE examination set to come to an end this Friday. Two police officers are on the spot and being held at Geta Police Station in 